you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. You are listening to Mind Shock True Crime. This is your host, Bruce McGuire. Today, we are looking at the infamous Darley Routier case. This one is much talked about. One of the most famous cases where a mother potentially, allegedly, killed her children that had a lot of news coverage, quite a bit. And there's still speculation on uh, both sides of this on whether or not she actually did it. And we will be exploring this case in typical mind shock fashion, comprehensive, exhaustive, and with logic and reason at the forefront. If you enjoyed the podcast, find it interesting and informative. You can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Help support MindShock. Get more mind-shocking content out there in an objective fashion. Sorely lacking from any of the mainstream media and even most podcasts out there. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube. Help support the channel that way. Get access to exclusive streams and chats. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit that bell for notifications. Make sure you allow our device to have those notifications come through. If you're still not getting notified, just make sure to like and comment more on all of the videos. More comments equals the YouTube algorithm actually notifying you of the latest episodes dropping. You can also check us out on Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and Patreon. Patreons do get priority for case topic logical analysis, co-podcast, or requests. You could also be a guest in the podcast, depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. All right, as usual, let's do the quick rundown on the wiki, and then we will dive into the minutia and all of the evidence for and against, and every single possible theory floated in every single possible rabbit hole in typical mind shot fashion. Darlie Lynn Peck Routier is an American woman from Rowlett, Texas, who was convicted and sentenced to death for the murder of her five-year-old son, Damon, in 1996. She has also been charged with capital murder in the death of her six-year-old son, Devin, who was murdered at the same time as Damon. To date, Routier has not been tried for Devin's murder. And the dynamics of this case are are quite uh, mind-shocking, if you will, unlike many other cases, so plenty to go over here. Damon and Devin were stabbed to death with a large kitchen knife in Routier's home, with Routier sustained while Routier sustained knife wounds to her throat and arm. Routier told authorities that the crime was perpetrated by an unidentified intruder. During the trial, the prosecution argued that Routier's injuries were self-inflicted, that the crime scene had been staged, and that she murdered her sons because of the family's financial difficulties. The defense argued that there was no reason Routier would have killed her children and that the case did not have a motive, a confession, or any witnesses. In February 1997, the jury found Routier guilty of the murder of Damon and sentenced her to death by lethal injection. Two appeals were filed by Routier, who maintains her innocence based on allegations of irregularities during the trial were denied. Since at least 2018, DNA tests have been ordered multiple times after technology has advanced. As of 2023, the results of these tests are still pending. And you would think that they wouldn't execute somebody. I mean, look at how much, I mean, unfortunately, you can see, I mean, more than zero is too many, but look at all the people executed that were exonerated after their executions by either DNA evidence or other evidence. I mean, it's just, it's really, really sad. That's why there's so much... uh, debate over the death penalty because i mean a lot of the times they don't even have the right guy or the right woman i mean it's just it's it's really crazy how so many goofs have blind faith in the infallibility of other humans routier's case has been the subject of multiple books and television shows routier's ex-husband believes that she is innocent now let's just dissect a couple things right off the bat here because this is mind shock we're gonna cover every angle So, some people believe she's innocent because of how remorseful and emotional she seems, and there's definitely a lot of emotion in it. However, there's there's a few different types of killers. So there are killers, even, even mothers who kill their own children, that are totally sociopathic or at least become sociopathic after the fact, 
there's no emotion, there's no remorse, there's nothing going on upstairs, or there's some kind of evil reveling in the act, whatever. Some people believe it's demonic possession or mental breakdown, mental illness manifesting, whatever the case may be, there's that group. There's also the group that didn't mean to do what they did and are very remorseful. Then there's another group where they meant to do what they did in the moment. But then after the fact, they, they are very, very emotional about what they did. And of course, they regret it. So being this emotional isn't indicative of innocence per se. And then, of course, there are innocent people who are very emotional because their kids are dead and they're being uh, tried for the murder of the kids. So there's all these different scenarios, all these different types of killers and, of course, innocent parties. So keeping all this in mind... There's really not much that can be gleaned from reading her emotions because without all this other information, she literally could fit into any of these categories. Now, obviously, people have their opinions, but just reading the emotion right off the bat here, it's it's very difficult. Also, are some alleging that she attempted to kill herself by slashing her own throat and then it didn't work? And now she's got to live with it. But if that was the case... Was she not able or didn't have an opportunity to commit suicide after the fact? This is if she's guilty. So, yeah, there's a lot to discuss here. Of course, this is mind shock. We're going to analyze everything in objective and logical, neutral fashion. I'm actually not deeply familiar with this case. Of course, I've seen over quick overviews of it in the past. As of yet, I do not have any particular theory that I am considering as a front-runner theory. We will examine everything step-by-step, step, attempting not to fall from any logical fallacies, of course. So, continuing on here, oh, and just addressing the ex-husband, again, the belief that she's innocent, uh, There, there's, again, a lot of different explanations. If she's guilty, obviously, he wouldn't want to believe that, you know, the mother of the children is guilty, his ex-wife is guilty, because how does that make him feel, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. some kind of denial. There's all these different possibilities. So, what the ex-husband believed doesn't necessarily mean anything either. Continuing on here, the murders, June 6th, 1996 at 2.31 a.m., 911 dispatchers in Rowlett, Texas, received a call from the Routier residence at 5801 Eagle Drive. Routier told the operator that her home had been broken into and that an intruder had stabbed her children, six-year-old Devin and five-year-old Damon, and cut her throat. Police arrived within three minutes of the 911 call. They discovered a window screen in the garage had been cut which indicated a possible entry point for an intruder. A search of the house and grounds did not locate an intruder. Having thus secured the site, police permitted paramedics to attend to the victims. Routier told the police that she had fallen asleep on the couch with her two boys while watching television, only to wake up later and discover an unknown man in the house. She stated that as she approached him, the man fled, dropping the knife in a utility room as he ran. After picking up the knife and chasing him away, Routier said she realized that she and her children had been wounded and that she called 911. Police found it highly suspicious that Routier and her sons had been severely wounded by an armed intruder without waking her until after the attack had occurred. All right, hold on a second. So we do have some red flags here in a few different directions. Now this being mind shock, my initial thought right now is that if Routier didn't do it, maybe she knows who did and she doesn't want to say. Would that account for all the funny business and inconsistencies? I mean, it's for a guy to just randomly... The other thing that stands out here, she wakes up and the guy is... This intruder, murderer, criminal is so terrified of her that he drops the knife and runs away? I mean, what am I missing here? That seems kind of odd. On the other hand, would, would Routier, would Darlene, would Darlie Routier really expect people to believe that if it wasn't true? I mean, is that going to be your go-to story? It, let's say, let's say she's, let's say you're guilty. You kill your own kids, whatever. Are you really going to try to sell a story? That as soon as this criminal murderer burglar sees you, he immediately drops his knife and runs in fear? I mean, that seems kind of weird. 
That seems kind of weird. Now, if Darlie Routier really has some kind of uh, possible mental health issues or a mental breakdown, and she did do it, again, we have to examine the split personality possibility because if she has a split personality, one of them did it, the other one didn't, so she would be passing polygraphs and all this other stuff. But that brings me to my next point, the brain fingerprint scan. I talk about this in a lot of true crime cases. This is a tool that, for whatever reason, is not being talked about enough. This is the basically the new generation lie detector test that cannot be fooled. Uh, it was used, the only high-profile case I can think of it being used, and uh, Stephen Avery actually took this brain fingerprint scan in the uh, Making a Murderer documentary, of course, uh, so there was no recognition of the state's case against him. So that doesn't necessarily mean he's innocent and he didn't kill Teresa Hallback. It just means that everything the state made up was complete bunk. So even if he killed her, it was not in any way as proposed by the state. So obviously a wrongful conviction and a sham trial. So... Other than that, I don't know that it's been used in any high-profile uh, true crime cases, but this is what the CIA uses and a lot of uh, military organizations use this because it simply measures brainwave response to identifying information. So it doesn't matter whether you're trying to lie or trying to tell the truth. It bypasses intention completely. Uh, I still have to do a dedicated podcast on the brain, brain fingerprint scan technology. A lot of people don't know about it. That will be coming up. Hopefully, I'll get to that soon. Now, if you do have a split personality, it is curious on whether or not they've done those tests on people with split personality. But again, these are the red flags I see right off the bat that the intruder, unless, okay, if the intruder killer is also some kind of guy with a mental health issue, and for whatever reason, he can only kill people who are asleep, and he has some kind of weird quirk or mental issue. So he thought he killed her. All of a sudden she jumps up. Was he that spooked? Because he's in the middle of committing a crime and murder. Did she simply spook him by jumping up? And then he just dropped the knife out of just being startled. Not that he was afraid of her. And then at that point he just ran because he didn't know what else to do. Because he had never been in that situation before. If this is some kind of weird serial killer that actually is afraid of people and he this serial killer only kills people in their sleep or whatever i mean or he was some, possibly on some kind of drugs i mean i guess you could come up with some scenarios where this would be plausible but if darley routier is the killer and she only has one personality it seems kind of strange like, would this be the go-to story that the killer is just going to randomly drop the murder weapon instead of getting rid of it and just run away instead of just finishing the job? It's a little weird, or at least running away with the murder weapon. All right, let's continue on here. Routier told police that the assailant escaped through the garage. Investigators said that the garage contained no blood drops and added that indications that no one had run through there at all. The window sills in the garage had untouched layers of dust, including the window that had been cut, implying that no one had actually climbed through it. And the mulch in the flower beds between the garage and the backyard gate was undisturbed. However, an unknown fingerprint was found on the windowsill that did not belong to anyone in the family. 75 yards from the house, a bloody sock was discovered. Lab tests revealed it had blood from both of Routier's sons on it. All right, so this is this is getting a little weird. Okay, so what is the implication here? So if if Darley Routier really did do this, why wouldn't she have ran through where she said the intruder ran through to make it look like somebody had ran through there and then dropped the, the sock through that path? If she's trying to frame an intruder. That question still needs to be answered. Or, well, there's also another theory we, we haven't gone through. If she had an accomplice that was going to help her kill her sons, is does that account for it? So whether she did the act herself or not, or with someone else, and someone else did it, and she knows who it is, and she was part of the plot for whatever reason, and then, you know, would that account for a lot of the strangers in this case? Like, a lot of these a lot of these famous cases that people just can't solve with 100% certainty, there's, there's obviously missing variable. So we have to figure out what that missing variable is, and does that account for all the other variables? Because a situation like that might account for it. Both Damon and Devin sustained fatal injuries. 
Her wounds, described as superficial, came within two millimeters of her corroded artery. Okay, so this this I do remember from looking at the case earlier. So what are the options? Is she that dumb that she's going to fake wounds right next to her corroded artery? I mean, that, that's kind of weird. Millimeter, we're not talking about inches. Two millimeters, that's almost nothing. Or did she really do did she really do it and she tried to commit suicide by slashing her own throat? That would make more sense in terms of the location. And she just simply botched it. Routier was treated at a hospital, released two days later. Her youngest son, seven-month-old Drake, was asleep upstairs with her husband, Darren, at the time of the murders. Both escaped harm. Okay. So this is where it does get a little weird because a lot of these cases with family annihilators per se, I mean, that's the term used. What, yeah, the motive is an issue. Why would she kill those two sons and not the other one? Because a lot of cases when parents snap, they kill all their children or one of the parents or one of the parents wants to get back at the other parents so they kill all the children, possibly their own spouse as well, and then possibly commit suicide after so was that really her plan to kill absolutely everybody? And then for whatever reason, in the middle of it, she had a mental breakdown from what she was doing or whatever other, I mean, we're talking about highly, regardless of intent or, or premeditation. I mean, these are human beings with emotions in the middle of these types of acts of murder, even when it's not your own family, one could only imagine the stress or emotions, unless one is a complete psychopath, sociopathic, psychotic, whatever, then maybe they don't feel anything and they could be very methodical about it. But if they're not in that category, then even if the plan was to kill everybody in the middle, I mean, it, it's really not that outlandish to consider the possibility that maybe she abandoned her plan midway. Although the layout is also a little weird. So everybody on the first floor was attacked, allegedly. Two of the sons on the first floor killed, the, th uh, the second floor husband and other son unharmed completely. Weird. All right, continuing on here, newscasts showed Routier and other family members holding a birthday party at the boy's grave to posthumously celebrate Devin's seventh birthday eight days after the murders. So here's the thing about that. A lot of cases where it's someone known to the victims, they could possibly commit a crime close to a birthday as it's an emotional, uh, possibly significant time. This is eight days after the murder. So not an incredible long period of time, but not really within a 24, 40, not right in that time period of the birthday. So yeah, that one's tough to, to see if that's, a, if that's connected anyway. She was shown smiling and laughing as she sprayed silly string on the graves in celebration singing happy birthday. Family members point out that the newscasts did not show an earlier video that depicted a solemn ceremony honoring the children. Four days later, June 18th, Routier was arrested and charged with capital murder. Routier later commented on the video saying, quote, he wanted to be seven. I did the only thing I knew to do to honor him and give him all his wishes because he wasn't here anymore. But how do you know what you're going to do when you lose two children? How do you know how you're going to act? End quote. Excellent point. So she, she seems kind of intelligent for even just bringing that up because a lot of people, they don't bring that up. They're just like, oh, they're just, you know, they don't actually elucidate the point or really think about it too deeply. It seems like she's fairly intelligent just from that but yeah, it's, it's difficult to read into that because, first of all, highly emotional state. And also, just from all the emotions, some people just tap into the happy memories at times, even at funerals. I mean, I think everybody's possibly had the experience of being at a funeral where there might be one family member who's uh, oddly smiley or happy. That's the way they deal with tragedy in either remembering the good or that's just how it comes out through nervousness. It comes out that way. So, and also just the desire to celebrate the life. So again, I'm not, I'm not saying that means anything one way or another. There's plausible explanations for both sides of that. In fact, I would argue this, if she really did do it, it seems again, just seems to me, it seems more, if she was smart, it seems to me more likely that she would go out of her way to appear even more sad for the media or for whatever. 
because she would want to put up that facade to get away with it. She wouldn't allow herself to freely I- express uh, possibly the emotions of whatever that can be interpreted a certain way. So again, just seems to me someone trying to get away with murder wouldn't be saying you wouldn't wouldn't come up with the story of oh as soon as the guy saw me he's totally terrified and dropped the knife and ran away from an unarmed woman with a throat with her throat slashed again if it was some kind of weirdo I mean maybe it did happen again I'm not saying it did or it didn't but if she's smart why would she come up with that story she could have maybe come up with something better and then also why would she just freely act this happy she see, she might be, if she was truly guilty, maybe she'd be more concerned about appearing innocent. On the other hand, there is an argument to be made if she's just completely insane and she doesn't care the way she looks like, or if there's some kind of narcissism going on where she thinks she's going to get away with it no matter what, so she would freely act that way in the video. You could also make that argument, and I will leave it to the Mind Shock listeners to kind of come up with what is more or less likely based on their own viewpoints. But again, with a certain amount of intelligence, it seems, again, just right off the bat, offhand, without diving deeper, which we will do, but just right as of this moment, it seems like someone might want to go more out of the way for that. Because some people argue Duper's delight, and they point to interviews of her, and they think some of these micro-expressions and smiles might be Duper's delight. Now, maybe they are, if she's guilty, but that's micro-expressions. That's not minutes and minutes or whatever of laughing and being happy in celebration at a grave. That's completely different. That's not a micro expression while you're trying to fool someone in a duper's delight fashion uh, for the cameras specifically because she wasn't even. Yeah. So that's completely different. We have to make the distinction there. But let's continue here with the trial. Routier's trial began January 6, 97 in Kerrville, Texas. The prosecution suggested that Routier murdered her sons because of the family's financial difficulties and described Routier as, quote, a self-centered woman, a materialistic woman, and a woman cold enough, in fact, to murder her own two children, end quote. Jurors also saw the silly string video. And isn't it unfair to show the jurors just the silly string video and not the somber ceremony video shouldn't they if they're looking at all pieces of evidence that seems a little bit uh unethical and uh immoral to hide that it seems steering on the side of the prosecution of course crime scene consultant james cron testified that evidence suggested the scene inside the routier residence had been staged the prosecution also suggested there was a financial motive for the murders since both boys had a life insurance policy on them. Okay, the plot thickens. The defense contended that this amounted to only $10,000, not enough to cover their funeral expenses. What a great fair counterpoint. That's a relatively small policy. A lot of policies are like 100K plus, but yet yeah, 10K, and if their financial difficulties are far in excess of 10K, then how could that small, tiny piece of money compared to the boys' lives motivate a mother? Now, obviously, you can point to all these other evil people in history. That's fine. But if they're that evil, they don't need a single dollar to kill their children. Uh, And then the other group of people who are evil, but only evil in a greedy sense where they would murder their children if the amount was high enough, this seems to fall into a category where the amount is so low that it's kind of hard to see how that would facilitate a proper motive. So the $10,000 wasn't even enough to cover the funeral expenses, let alone uh, other... uh, financial difficulties. So yeah, that's a, that's a fair counterpoint there. Furthermore, they asked why if she was willing to murder for money, she did not kill her husband instead as he had an $800,000 life insurance policy. Wow. Okay. But that goes back to my other theory where maybe she did plan to kill all of them. But, but yeah, why kill the sons? I mean, yeah, that that's hard, especially children. I mean, even if they were adult sons, you would think the mother would first kill the husband. I mean, that actually happens far more often. So, you know, or the husband killing the wife. I mean, eight hundred thousand dollars. That seemed to that that might I, again. I haven't gone through all of the details of their financing, but eight hundred k. I mean, a lot of people kill for a lot less than that. But ten k, which wouldn't even be enough to cover the funerals. I mean, that that seems counterproductive there. So, yeah, was the plan to kill the husband, was the plan to kill them all because it wouldn't be believable if just the husband was killed and then she abandoned the plan midway through? I don't know if anybody's uh, floated 
floated that theory. The defense also questioned why, if she killed her sons to preserve her lavish lifestyle, she left her youngest son, seven-month-old Drake, alive and unharmed. The counterpoint there, I mean, seven months old, I mean, even, see, there's a whole lot, lot of different types of killers. There's killers that won't kill children of any age, and then there's other kill killers that might kill children, but they would never kill babies. So again, to try to really understand the motivations in her mind and possibly shifting, changing motivations. I wouldn't take that as definitive proof that she's innocent either. I do not claim anything is true or untrue. This is, of course, mind shock where the motto is. The only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. But if the plan changed midway through or she always planned to keep the youngest alive, I mean, a lot of parents, especially mothers, they do have a soft spot for their youngest, especially if there's only if they're less than a year old. And so if the original plan was to kill the husband, including the children, you know, she's looking at over 800K, that might be enough to sustain one child. So I don't know. Weird. Routier was pr represented at trial by lawyer Douglas Mulder. I'm assuming no relation to the X-Files. Defense attorneys said that there was no reason why she would have killed her children and that the case did not have a motive, a confession, or any witnesses. They asserted that it was unrealistic to accuse Routier of staging a crime scene. Her attorneys advised her not to appear on the witness stand, but she testified anyway and, quote, withered under cross-examination by prosecutor Toby Shook, end quote. That's an interesting last name. Do some people think this is a psyop as well? I mean, how many people has Toby Shook left Shook on the witness stand? How many how, how many cases has Mulder solved? I mean, this is uh, or successfully defended. I mean, I mean, this is this is a weird case, no matter how you look at it. Why? Yeah, I mean, the desire to appear on the witness stand. Yeah, I mean. There's so many different scenarios on, on, you know, including her being innocent and her being guilty, in which case she might want to take the stand. So there's really, but taking the stand and withering. So the fact that she withered, does that mean she's not a narcissistic cold psycho? Because a narcissistic cold psycho probably wouldn't wither. So was this just a desperate emotional woman looking to clear her name and desperately wanting to against all advice? And she just couldn't handle it. Or is this, again, a split personality situation where uh, one of her personalities might be unaware that the other had killed the children? And perhaps it was a plot that was uh, halfway finished and uh, she changed her mind in the middle. Or further theory, again, pure speculation. I'm not alleging this is true. Just theorizing down every single possible rabbit hole. Was there a, a guy on the side and he's partially either completely or partially responsible for the situation? And she didn't want to reveal who it was, even if she didn't commit the murders herself. San Antonio Chief Medical Examiner Vincent DeMaio testified that the wound to Routier's neck came within two millimeters of a corroded artery and that it was not consistent with the self-inflicted wounds he had seen in the past. I mean, yeah, how many people would self-inflict a wound right next to their artery on their neck? I mean, that, if they're trying to survive, if she wasn't trying to survive, then okay, that, that's more plausible. That deferred from the assertions of her treating physicians who had told police officials that the wounds might have been self-inflicted. Tom Bevel testified that cast-off blood found on the back of Routier's nightshirt indicated that she had raised the knife over her head as she withdrew it from each boy to stab again. I mean, if they had extensive blood spatter experts go through all these different scenarios and the blood on her nightshirt only matched that scenario. See, the thing with blood spatter, I mean, in certain situations, obviously, it could it could point to, uh, you know, the most plausible scenario. But was she laying down? Did the blood smear? I mean, how accurate would that even be based on her movements after that? One crucial aspect of the case of the defense case was the bloody sock found outside the home. While the police contended that this was merely a ruse designed to falsely implicate an intruder that had fled the scene, the defense contended that it proved Routier could not have committed the crime. Damon was alive when the paramedics arrived on the scene, and the medical examiner testified that the boy could only have survived approximately eight minutes after receiving his injuries. 
Routier was on the phone with 911 for almost six minutes. The defense argued that this is not this did not leave enough time for Routier to cut herself, stage the crime scene, plant the sock outside the house, and then return before the paramedics arrived. They also stated that despite her injuries, Routier's blood was not found in the garage or anywhere outside the home. The prosecution countered that Routier could have planted the sock before herself inflicting her own injuries and that the medical examiner stated survival time for Damon after he was stabbed was only an estimation. Okay, but an estimation within what, I mean, you know, it couldn't be hours and hours off. Yeah, this is going to turn into a math problem, possibly, unless she had an accomplice. If she had an accomplice, this all kind of even makes sense. Or she's innocent and whoever did it. Why would they take the sock, though? I mean, this is kind of weird. Also, is there in, is there information police have not revealed in this case? Did Damon say anything in those eight minutes? Or was he not conscious? On February 1st, Routier was convicted of murdering Damon. On February 4th, she was sentenced to death by lethal injection. Women sentenced to death under Texas law are housed in the Mountain View unit in Gatesville, Texas. I'm assuming the reason they didn't try her for Devin was just in case they got they couldn't get the conviction on Damon, so then they would try again. I mean, I'm assuming that's what it was. Post-trial claims and appeals. Defense attorneys allege numerous errors were made during Routier's trial and in the official transcript of it, as well as the investigation of the murders, especially at the crime scene. An appeals court dismissed these claims, as did a court ruling on her habeas corpus petition. In June 2008, Routier was granted the right to new DNA tests. Her appeals were remanded to the state level for improved DNA testing. On January 29, 2014, Chief Judge of the Western District Fred Beery granted a request from prosecution and defense for her case for further DNA tests vital to the defense to be performed on a bloody fingerprint. So it wasn't just a fingerprint, it was a bloody fingerprint found in the house, a bloody sock, and her nightshirt. In 2018, the Criminal District Court No. 3 ordered a third round of DNA testing with the backing of both prosecution and defense. Okay, that's something we don't see every day. Because in a lot of these cases, one side wants to block this for, you know, for obvious reasons. Here, both the prosecution and the defense wants the test. That's interesting. So they both want the truth. And they does that mean they both want the truth and they both have doubts? Or do they just want to shut up other people? And of course, these are all still pending. Divorce, June 2011, Darren Routier filed for divorce from his wife, saying that the decision was mutual and very difficult, and that he still believes his wife is innocent. He said that they decided to divorce to end the limbo that they had been in since her arrest and conviction. I mean, is this another first? I mean, how often is the, is the woman in prison convicted and possibly and sentenced to death waiting for execution where there's a divorce after a certain period of time? I mean, this is definitely an unusual case. There's certain aspects of this case that make it incredibly unusual. I'm assuming that's why I was so requested on Mindshock to go, to go through all of the possible scenarios and all of the evidence here. And of course, this was covered extensively in books and uh, documentaries. So let's go a little deeper here. So this is uh, DallasNews.com. Did Darlie Routier kill her kids? Doubts remain two decades later. If it hadn't been for that crazy, silly string, Darlie Lynn Routier might be a free woman today. And that's another interesting point that do most people believe she was convicted just because of the video and playing on the emotions of the jury instead of physical evidence? Because trying to read somebody's emotions after the fact subjectively, and again, a highly emotional woman, I mean, that's really evidence of nothing. Because again, different, and also different people react in different ways. So, so there's no real de facto way for how someone should behave in this kind of instance, particularly when holding some kind of birthday celebration at a grave site, which is a little bit unusual in and of itself. I don't know how many times that has been done. I, I mean, maybe here and there, but I don't think that's a popular thing to do. This is by Tasha Tsaiperes, May 10th, 2019. 
If it hadn't been for that silly string, Darlie Lynn Routier might be a free woman today. At least that's what many people believe about the notorious Rowlett woman now on death row after savagely stabbing her five and six year old sons 20 years ago Monday as her husband and seven month old son slept upstairs. I mean, there's already an, an issue here because this, this writer is stating as, as if it's definitive fact that she did stab them. Hmm. Shortly after the murders, NBC5 captured video of Routier with bleached hair, smacking gum and giggling, spraying silly string on her son's graves. Jurors in Kerr County watched the video at least seven times before convicting Routier of capital murder in 1997 for the deaths of one of the boys. They ended up deliberating on the silly string. Her mother, Darley Key, told the Dallas Morning News this week, silly string is not a lethal weapon. Routier's family says the silly string provided by Darley's sister was part of a birthday celebration. Her oldest son, Devin, would have turned seven that day. The party followed a prayer service for both Devin and his younger brother, Damon, but TV cameras didn't capture the tears, Key said. Only a frolicking Routier. Key maintains her daughter's innocence, saying an intruder killed the boys. And even two decades later, there are lingering questions in some minds about Routier's guilt. Some point to a bloody sock found in the alley behind the family's home as proof Routier was telling the truth about an intruder. Others don't believe Routier is innocent, but wonder if she really acted alone. And many people still have a hard time believing that a young mother could butcher her babies in cold blood. Prosecutors in the case believe the matter is settled, but it continues to wind its way to the state's appellate court system. No date has been set for Routier's execution. Her attorney and family say they believe new DNA testing will prove that someone else was in the home that night 20 years ago. They say the pending tests could give Routier, now 46, a chance at a new trial. This is not solved, Key said. They have not found who killed my grandsons. That person is still walking the streets. National news. The case of a suburban mom fatally stabbing her young sons and then faking her own attack to cover the crime that made national news in June 1996. Photos of Devin and Damon Routier wearing matching white jackets and bow ties peppered TV screens and newspapers, and people had suddenly heard of Rowlett, then a town of 35,000 people. Police were called to the Routier home on Eagle Drive around 2.30 a.m. June 6, 96. Devin, 6, was already dead when paramedics arrived. He had been stabbed all the way through his torso. You know something else that's weird? So this crime occurred in June, the sixth month of the year, on the 6th in 1996, and Devin was six years old. That's quite a lot of sixes. That's a lot of sixes. June 6, 6, 6, 96. Does anybody find that weird? He had been stabbed all the way through his torso. Damon 5 was gasping for breath. He had been stabbed in the back and died shortly after. So they were stabbed differently? What does that mean? It just tears at your heart what those two boys went through that night, said lead prosecutor Greg Davis. Even 20 years later, it's hard to think about the suffering they went through. It's something you never forget. Routier had stab wounds on her right arm and a slash across her throat within two millimeters of a corroded artery. She was taken to the hospital where she underwent surgery. Another possibility, was she was that an accident that she slashed her own throat? If she if she's guilty and if she's faking her injuries, did she did she in swinging the knife was it accidental that she slashed her throat and she didn't mean to? Could that explain that? She told police that Damon woke her up and she saw a man leave through the garage. The screen over a window in the garage had been slashed. All right, wait a second. So Damon gasping for breath and possibly touching her woke her up? Huh. Detectives quickly suspected someone inside the home killed the boys and medical professionals said Routier's wounds appeared 
self-inflicted. And of course, other experts countered that. Police doctors and nurses who talked to Routier after her son's murder described her as unaffected by their deaths. She didn't appear to be grieving. The silly string video played into that narrative. You know, what, what's also curious, Did so different people would have been exposed to her at different times. So did the defense, how, how many people did the defense find that did find her emotional? And then the prosecutors found people that only saw her in an unemotional disassociated state, which is also not unusual for a mother who's lost children. So yeah, I mean, again, it, it's, that doesn't, it's kind of hard to, to dissect that, to give that any kind of meaning for one side or the other. Friends, family, and former neighbors described Routier as a good mother. She had no reason to kill her baby boys, they said. But that silly string video painted a different picture. It showed a gleeful woman literally dancing on her slain baby's graves. She was charged with two counts of capital murder days later. The defense claimed she was grief-stricken and shocked, Prosecutor Davis said. The video showed she wasn't either of those. So here's the thing. I This is, how I, this is really how the case should proceed throw out the silly string video because if that's all you have to prove guilt you have a problem of a case this is a wrongful conviction even if she's guilty if that's the only evidence you have of an emotional mother laughing i mean she could have who knows what kind of psychotic break she could have suffered after the fact and not to mention supposedly there was a lot of grieving and crying in the ceremony beforehand that wasn't captured or at least not shown to the jurors so i would just take that take that out of the equation what else do you have? Because if you don't have solid evidence outside of that video, I mean, how strong of a case do you have? Again, that doesn't mean she's innocent, but that just points to the strength or lack thereof in terms of the case. The silly string video became a key part of Routier's trial, which was moved to Caraville because of heavy pre-trial news coverage in North Texas. Prosecutors described Routier as a materialistic and self-absorbed. They used her bleached hair and breast implants as examples of that. Wow. I mean, that doesn't mean anything. There, what the heck? There's How many countless mothers with bleached hair and breast implants are there that are completely caring and nurturing and would never harm their children in any way? I mean, that means literally nothing. What is, this is weird. Routier's appellate attorney, Stephen Cooper, said prosecutors focused more on judging Routier's character and grief than on physical evidence in the house, which he said pointed to an outside assailant. Now, again, whether it points to an outside assailant or not, that's where the, the, everybody should be focused instead of these character assassinations, which might not even be true. She was portrayed as this bleach blonde with enhanced breasts living beyond her means, Cooper said. She did have bleached hair. She did have breast enhancements. That doesn't make you kill your kids. Yeah, I mean, it's weird. You would you could state, like, what, 99.9999999, a whole bunch of nines of mothers with bleached hair and breast implants do not kill or harm their kids in any way. So, yeah, that doesn't, you know, this, yeah, this is rough. To get a death penalty, you need stuff like silly string and character assassination. Can't fully grieve. In the 20 years since Devin and Damon's death, Routier's family hasn't been able to fully grieve for the boys. I want my daughter home, Key said. And then we'll grieve together for Devin and Damon. Key regularly visits her daughter at the Mountain View unit in Gatesville. She plans to be there Monday on the 20th anniversary of the boys' murders. She won't be allowed to hug or touch her daughter. They'll sit separated by a pane of glass. Routier declined interview requests for this story. He says she never once questioned her daughter's innocence. She and her family believe prosecutors wronged Routier, who has not been able to hug or touch her now 20-year-old son, Drake, since her conviction. How do they give Drake his entire childhood without his mommy except through the glass, he asked. Drake lives in Lubbock with his father. Darley and Darren Routier divorced in 2011. Neither Darren nor Drake could be reached for comment, but Darren Routier had previously said he believes his ex-wife is innocent. After the murders, Drake was put in the custody of his paternal grandparents, but he lived with several relatives over the years. At 17, he was diagnosed with leukemia. He is still undergoing cancer treatment, but is expected to survive, he said. I think it bothered him the first time he was able to talk to his mother on the phone was to tell her he had cancer, she said. Wow. 
here's the thing though like after the kid is 18 i mean it's kind of up to him i mean even before i guess what he wants to believe about his own mother i mean obviously no kid would want to believe that his mother did this but here's the thing this is why intuition sometimes gets a bad name because you do have like bad apples and people who do not have accurate intuition but i would argue that for the that in the majority of cases a mother unless she's lying to cover for her daughter a mother could have inklings of whether or not her daughter would be capable of something like that. So there, there's unwavering love and support. And in other cases, there's wavering love and support, even when the family member is innocent. So we have to keep all these things in mind. But again, this, yeah, it's, it's just so tough. It's so tough. And then the tragedy of, of her, the surviving son having leukemia. I mean, that's, that's horrible. I mean, there are also some irregularities, per se, regarding Drake and Darren Routier, which I will get to in a moment. But let's finish this article here. And again, intuition of a kid. Would a kid be able to tell whether or not his mother was capable of this? And again, if she has a split personality, perhaps that could also uh, foggy things up. Prosecutor's skeptical. For 20 years... The gist of Routier's story has remained the same. She woke up to a man in her home and chased him out through the garage. But to prosecutors and other skeptics, some of Routier's details of the attack don't add up. How could Routier, a purported light sleeper, not wake up while her sons were brutally attacked and her own throat was slashed? How was she able to fight off an attacker but not notice her children were bloody on the floor? And why would an innocent woman mention to a 911 operator that she touched the butcher knife and hoped police could still pull fingerprints of the assailant. Because maybe she did. I mean, th this is kind of weird. If she's relatively smart, yeah, that's tough. It almost seems like only an innocent person or, a, or possibly a guilty person with a split personality would go through these motions, or possibly a complete unhinged loon if she's guilty. In the days after her son's death, Routier and her husband gave interviews to local media. She talked to nurses in the hospital. She talked to police. Each time her story was a little different, said attorney Toby Shook. Man, what a name. Who served as a prosecutor on the case. Shook is now a Dallas cr criminal defense attorney. When Routier took the witness stand, she testified all day before a standing room only crowd, claiming she suffered traumatic amnesia. She said she couldn't remember and slept through the murder, said Shook, who cross-examined Routier. But whenever she needed to explain the evidence, she had a good memory. She claimed a vacuum sat atop her bloody footprints because she had trouble walking and needed to use it as a cane. That made no sense because her legs worked just fine, Shook said. She said her blood was around the kitchen sink because she applied wet towels to her boy's wounds. Prosecutors said Routier probably cut her own throat over the sink. They described her injuries as superficial. If she had been attacked, her injuries would have been far, far worse, Shook said. How would he know? What? I mean, what the heck? This is such a weird case because you, you could plausibly explain everything on both sides. That's what makes this such a tough one because seemingly you could explain things both for her being innocent and guilty. The two R's. Routier and Rowlett are still linked. News crews and people with cameras still visit the two-story red brick house on Eagle Drive, which looks mostly the same as it did that night. Blow Hartley and his family still live down the street from the Routier house. He remembers seeing police carrying out the kitchen sink where they said she washed the knife used to kill the boys. We were all freaking out. She came over to my neighbor's house that day and said, somebody killed my kids. And we believed her, Hartley said. Why would you think a mom would do that? You wouldn't. New people eventually moved into the house and asked Hartley to put in tile for them. When I got there and started surveying, you could actually still see the chips in the concrete where the knife hit. You know when she did it, he said, and I said, nope, this is too weird. New people have moved into the neighborhood, which was rocked recently by a rare December tornado. Like many people nationwide, those in the neighborhood now disagree on Routier's guilt. I've seen the documentaries in the news, and I think she's innocent, said Carl Hust. 
The husband upstairs asleep and doesn't hear anything. I think he had something to do with it. When he tells people he's from Rowlett, people ask if he knows about her or believes she's innocent. But others, like Patsy Thomas, studied the case after moving to the neighborhood and believe Routier did it. Every time I go by that house, I get sad, Thomas said. And there's not a time I round that corner when I don't think about those children. Bloody sock mystery. Routier's supporters often point to a bloody sock found in the alley 75 yards from the family's home. Yeah, that's not that close. I mean, that's, that's three quarters of a football field. I mean, that, yeah, that's tough. The sock had blood droplets from both Damon and Devin. Her supporters believe the sock proves that there was no way Routier killed her sons, stabbed herself, cut the window, and had time to run barefoot down the alley, all while leaving no blood trail of her own. The medic, did someone look at her feet, though, to see if she had run down the alley? Or did she put shoes on, run down the alley, come back, take them off? The medical examiner testified Damon, and is that a random thing to do to prove that there was an intruder? You're going to touch the knife. You're going to make up the story that the intruder was afraid of an unarmed woman and just simply ran away and dropped the murder weapon. And at the same time, you're going to think to put a bloody sock 75 yards down an alley. That seems kind of random. I mean, it doesn't, nothing really adds up here. This is really one of the most perplexing mysteries, I have to say. It's tough here. I mean, there's a plausible explanation seemingly for every single situation, but she would have to, if she's completely insane, I guess she could be guilty, yes. But it's difficult to rectify her being guilty and sane from all of these uh, purported choices that she made that night. The medical examiner testified Damon could have survived about eight minutes with his wounds because Routier's 911 call lasted nearly six minutes and the boy was alive when paramedics arrived. Many believe it would have been impossible for Routier to stage the crime scene and take the sock to the alley. I mean, could she have stabbed him? Taken? No, yeah, that's tough. I mean, hmm, six minutes. Yeah, this is a math problem. I mean, unless some people are going to say she took his blood from when he was alive, not that day, from let's say an earlier day or a week ago, maybe he skinned his knee falling from a bike or something, and she had his blood, put it on the sock, put it in the alley before she stabbed anybody. Theoretically, I guess you did, but why would why would she put a sock 75 yards down? I mean, it's it's that's a weird distance. I mean, if it was right next to the house, it would almost make more sense, but... I don't know. Lloyd Harrell, a private investigator who worked on Routier's defense team, still questions how Routier was able to cut her own throat at the angle it was slashed and stab herself in her dominant right arm. And he said the way Routier described waking up sounds more like coming to after passing out, not sleeping. Routier, well, also, it, so if she's got blood loss from this neck wound, right next to her corroded artery and she's in a state of shock. I mean, perhaps, I mean, would her memory, are we expecting her memory to be infallible? I mean, and add all the emotions to it. I mean, I don't know. Why, why would her memory be perfect in that situation? I mean, whose would? Routier's defense and appeals attorney have also pointed to an unidentified bloody fingerprint found on the coffee table in the family's room, in the family room. But Prosecutor Davis said Routier supports cherry pick pieces of evidence to support the theory that she's in it. Cherry pick? I mean, that's kind of an important thing. A bloody fingerprint right there on the coffee table in the middle of the room where they're getting killed? That's cherry picking? That might be the most single most significant piece of evidence. And that fingerprint does not match her? I mean, you would think they checked it against the husband as well. So, wow. I mean, this is insane. This is completely insane. They put more stock in a, in a video at a cemetery of a distraught mother looking happy than they do in a bloody fingerprint right next to the victims. I mean, this is kind of weird. It's important to know the totality of the evidence. The totality of the evidence is what convinced the jury, he said. Not all evidence is equal, though. I mean, what the heck? Cooper, Routier's appellate attorney, said he understands why a jury convicted her, even though he believes she's innocent. 
Everyone wants to get vindication for these kids getting slaughtered in their own home. And I get that, he said. Jurors want to believe their government has got the right person. All sorts of authority-worshipping cultists and bootlickers out there. It's unclear how long the additional DNA testing will take or whether Routier will ever get another trial. The State Court of Criminal Appeals upheld her conviction in 2003. This is kind of weird. Like, there's an unidentified bloody fingerprint. It's not like it's a fingerprint that's not bloody or might not have been connected to that. Because if it's just a random fingerprint that could have been there from weeks before, I mean, this is supposedly a bloody fingerprint. Right next to the bodies, like, what the heck? Davis, who has prosecuted more than 20 death penalty cases in Dallas, Collin, and McLean counties, said it's unusual that Routier still remains on death row. He said most of his cases have been resolved after 10 years. The defense has yet to poke a credible hole in the case. That speaks to the strength of the evidence before the jury. He said, what evidence? A video at a cemetery? Like, why is he not citing, like, definitive pieces here? But that hasn't stopped Routier's family and friends from standing behind her. There's so many exonerations now, Key said, and I just keep thinking, when is it Darley's turn? It's a good question. If she was wrongfully convicted. Well, I mean, it is a wrongful conviction, even if she's guilty, because there's no evidence here. If there wasn't the bloody fingerprint, I mean, I could understand. I mean, there's some circumstantial evidence there. You still have to make the math work on the bloody sock, though. If there was no bloody sock or the unidentified bloody fingerprint, then you only have the weird issue of the location and the exact manner of her inflicting these wounds on herself. Because that's also strange. Can it be 100% verified someone is able to do that? And would they do that so close to the corroded artery unless they were trying to kill themselves and they failed? I mean, there's some weird issues here, too. November, June 98, Routier's relatives file a lawsuit accusing two police detectives and a prosecutor of invading their privacy by hiding microphones at the boys' graves. Wow. That's crazy. I mean, were they hoping to, like, elicit some sort of confession? I mean, that's kind of weird. So it seems like they really just zeroed in on her right away. Did they even possibly investigate any other avenue other than her and possibly the husband? And we will get to the husband in a moment. I'm going to go over one more in-depth article here. Maybe Darley didn't do it by Skip Hollinsworth on TexasMonthly.com, July 2002 a little bit closer to the time of the uh, murders. Five years after she was convicted of murdering her son, Darlene Routier sits on death row in Gatesville, still maintaining her innocence. This month, as her lawyers prepared to head into court again, new information about her raises the possibility, however slim, that she's been telling the truth all along. This is, I have to say though, this photo looks a little strange of Darley behind the shatterproof glass in the visitor's area at the Mountain View unit in Gatesville. I mean, is this the look of someone hopeful? that the, see, Again, everything in this case has a plausible explanation on both sides. Because is it the look of someone who's, uh, who's hopeful that they're going to be exonerated? Because this, this is a few years in, of course. I mean, I don't know what she looks like right now. It would be interesting to compare whether she's lost hope or not. Does this look like she's hopeful of an exoneration, or does it look like she's deranged? I mean, I can't tell. I really can't tell here, because it almost seems like just about every piece of evidence can land on both sides. I mean, other than that bloody fingerprint, that needs to be matched. I mean, that's just weird. Okay. If you haven't seen Darlie Routier since she was sent to death row five and a half years ago, if your only memories of her are the glamorous photos when her hair was platinum blonde, her face was caked with makeup and her fingers were covered with diamond rings, you might not recognize her today. She is now 32 years old. Her hair is long and chestnut brown and pulled away from her face, accentuating her cheekbones and bright hazel eyes. Her body is toned thanks to a daily workout regime of 500 sit-ups in her cell and a vigorous two-hour walk in the prison yard. When she takes her seat behind the shatterproof glass in the visitor's area of the Mountain View unit in Gatesville, she smiles pleasantly, rests her elbows on the table, with a soft giggle, says that she has been reading the latest Harry Potter book so she can talk about the plot with her youngest son, Drake, age six, the only one of her children who is still alive. Okay, this makes me think of yet another theory. If she's innocent, 
is she kind of just this bubbly personality? And that's why even in tragic times, she's still able to laugh about it. I mean, doesn't everybody know at least one person kind of like that? Like even in tragedy, they're still able to laugh. That's just their personality. I mean, yeah, it's, it's tough because accurately understanding her personality is kind of important if you're going to read into all of this. Again, I don't even really want to go down that rabbit hole for this particular case because there's explanations on, on all these different sides for her behavior. So it, it seems better just to focus on physical evidence. She receives a constant stream of visitors, friends and family, lawyers, journalists, and PIs. They study her the same way that crowds at the Louvre stare through a sheet of bulletproof glass into the enigmatic eyes of the Mona Lisa. Perhaps a tad dramatic here. They listen to her talk in her light, sugary voice about the sympathetic letters she receives from other parents who have lost their children, about her prison job cross-stitching baby blankets that are later sold to state prison employees about the stories that she reads in Parenting Magazine, which she receives every month, and about her disbelief that she's still in prison. Why is this happening to me, she says with a catch in her throat. Why is it so hard for people to see the truth? On June 6, 96, Devin Routier, who was six, and Damon, five, were murdered as they slept on the ground floor of the family's well-kept brick home in Rowlett, a suburb east of Dallas. Devin was stabbed twice in the chest with such force that the knife almost went all the way through his body. Damon, well, here's another point, too, because this is a small-statured 20-some-year-old woman. Has anybody done the physics calculations? I mean, yeah, the kid is relatively small, but, hmm... I wonder if they measured somebody of her body type being able to exert enough force to do that. Damon was stabbed half a dozen or more times in the back. And here's the other thing, too. I mean, we were talking about this in the Idaho student homicides, because this, the if this was a single killer in the Idaho student homicides where it killed four people, just the repeated stabbings, that's got to be exhaustive. I mean, what kind of shape does someone have to be in? I mean, it looks from all accounts here that uh, Darley wasn't quite a physical specimen or an athlete in any way. She was kind of this soft, bubbly blonde, whatever. Now, again, when someone goes crazy, obviously they can exert more strength than usual, but hmm. I mean, I don't know if people have talked about that. So, so Damon was stabbed half a dozen times or more in the back. And Devin stabbed only twice, but the knife went almost all the way through his entire body. Would a female of her stature be capable of that? I actually don't know. Again, that I wonder if they actually did tests on that, like with a dummy or whatever. Because in the JonBenet Ramsey case, they did the test on whether or not Burke would have been strong enough to exert the damage on Jean Benet's skull. And supposedly he would not. I mean, there is some conflict there, there's, you know, whatever. Some people think he could. It, it, it might be within a certain threshold of margin of error, but I wonder if they did tests with Darley here. Now, in prison, supposedly she's in a lot better shape. She does all this working out, et cetera. Maybe she could, but at that time, was she able to? Darley, who was also sleeping downstairs, had two slice wounds in her right forearm and one in her left shoulder, and her throat had been cut. Wow, okay. So yeah, you would think if she's going to self-inflict, it'll be like, yeah, arms, maybe shoulder, but then also her throat. That seems unusual. Doctor said she survived only because the knife stopped two millimeters short of her corroded artery. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a rough detail. Between that and the bloody fingerprint, I might possibly have to lean slightly towards innocence here. In a written statement given to police a few days later, Darley, then 26, told the following story. She was awakened by Damon, I mean, of course, brain fingerprint scan. I mean, you would think she would agree to it. I mean, she's eager to be exonerated. Why not do the brain fingerprint scan? That could settle that. And of course, the husband, too. I'd be very curious in him getting a brain fingerprint scan. She was awakened by Damon's cries of mommy, mommy. In the dark, she didn't even notice she was hurt. She saw... And again, that actually does speak to truth, because if anybody's ever been cut, even just, you know, making dinner or something, you have a like you have a cut with a really sharp knife. A lot of times you don't even notice. Like I remember cutting something, I cut my thumb, and it wasn't until like a minute or two later I saw the blood all over the place, but I didn't actually feel the cut. 
So that might actually point to her telling the truth there as well. Because if she's this, if she's this twenty-some-year-old Texas bleached blonde, presumably she's not super intelligent. I don't know. Maybe I'm. Uh, if anybody knows her academic background, maybe I'm being a little superficial here. But if she's innocent, perhaps she would just say it like she believed it, and she wouldn't necessarily think about whether or not say it as she believed it happened. She's, she's saying the truth the best of her ability, and she's not necessarily thinking about how other people are going to observe it or take it or think she's innocent or guilty if she's more on the simple side. Obviously, not all bleach blondes are simple. Some of them are very smart. Again, I'm not claiming to know which is which, but yeah, this is, uh, this, this is very problematic, of course. She saw a man moving through the kitchen and followed him as he went toward the garage. When she got to the utility room, she saw a knife and picked it up. Only then, she said, did she return. So she didn't see him drop the knife, per se? Only then, she said, did she return to find Devin and Damon and realized that she had been stabbed, too. Darley's husband, Darren... What are, see, there's a lot of what are the chances that Darley has a husband named Darren? I mean, that's almost the exact same name. Okay, they choose their kids' names, but they don't choose their own names. Darley and Darren on six six ninety six. Surprise! This didn't happen at six a.m. But yeah, this this is weird. Okay, Darley's husband, Darren, who was sleeping upstairs with their infant son Drake, came downstairs after hearing his wife's screams and began administering CPR to Devin. By then, the assailant had disappeared. Twelve days after Damon's and Devin's deaths, the police arrested Darley for their murders. They had no eyewitnesses, no confession, no motive. What they did have was an intriguing trail of circumstantial evidence that suggested there was no intruder that night, physical evidence suggesting that Darley had staged the crime, doctor's statements suggesting her wounds were self-inflicted, and a peculiar scene caught on videotape a few days after the murders. On what would have been Devin's seventh birthday, Darley drove to the cemetery with family and friends, wished her son a happy birthday, and then sprayed silly string all over the grave. Here's a mother who has supposedly been the victim of a violent crime, said Dallas County District Attorney, Assistant District Attorney Greg Davis, the lead prosecutor in the case. She has just lost two children, and yet she's out literally dancing on their graves. I mean, does she have the mental processing to deal with this? So again, yeah, that, that really doesn't, I don't know, call me crazy, but that doesn't really mean it. That video doesn't mean anything to me. Within eight months of the crime, Darley was convicted and sentenced to death by a jury in the hill country town of Caraville, where the trial had been moved. She seemed destined to be remembered as yet another stressed out mother who had suddenly spiraled out of control. Three true crime paperbacks published in the year after her conviction characterized her as the embodiment of evil. But over the years, numerous news stories and an ongoing investigation by Darley's appellate attorneys have raised questions about what really happened that night. Could it be that the police and the prosecutors manipulated the evidence to implicate someone they decided must have done it? A growing chorus of observers of the case believe so. At least half a dozen websites have been set up to proclaim Darley's innocence. One of them, for DarleyRoutier.org has received more than 7.5 million hits since January 2000. A juror from her original trial now says that he and his fellow jurors made the wrong decision. You know, it's weird. A lot of these authority-worshipping cultists and these clueless goofs who pretend that juries never get anything wrong and that there aren't any uh, innocent people in prisons, I wonder what they would say to this of jurors who changed their mind after the fact. Because there's a lot of goofs out there particularly in the Stephen Avery case, uh, making a murder. I mean, there's so many goofs out there who hallucinate that the, the police would never be involved in any kind of shady business, despite all the evidence, and that jurors could never got, get it wrong, either being intimidated or not. They're just infallible gods that always get it right. It's, it's, it's a really weird thing. The author of one of the true crime books has also changed her mind, claiming the jury heard perjured testimony and was never shown photos that would have proved Darley was a victim of a savage attack. Yeah, I mean, this looks like a clear wrongful conviction. Even if she's guilty, this looks like a clear wrongful conviction. 
Even the most experienced legal hands have found themselves sucked in by the Routier saga. This past March, in oral arguments before the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals into whether procedural flaws were made during the original trial, the nine judges began peppering lawyers with questions on other aspects of the case. Was there an insurance policy on the children, which might have given Darley a reason to kill them? When Darley talked to homicide detectives, did she make any kind of confession? As the hearing ended, one of the more curious judges mentioned to me motioned to me and asked me to point out Darley's mother, Darley Key, who had made headlines of her own for her passionate attacks on the assistant DA and Darley's husband, Darren, a headstrong machinist son who, after the trial, had likenesses of his wife and their three boys tattooed on his right arm. This month, with Darley's defense attorney set to file a writ of habeas corpus that claims new evidence proves her innocence, the debate is going to get even more heated. Darley's lead appellate attorney, Stephen Cooper, has announced that an analysis recently conducted by one of the country's most respected forensic anthropologists determined that a bloody fingerprint found on a glass table in the room where the murders took place does not, as the prosecutors contend, match either of the boys. Nor does it match Darley, Darren, or any of the investigators or emergency workers who were out the house that night. It almost certainly belongs to an unidentified adult bolstering the defense's theory that someone broke into the house. But the most startling new piece of information, one that has never been publicly revealed before now, could very well answer the most baffling question about the murders. Why would someone show up in a nice new suburban neighborhood, target a house, on a well-lit cul-de-sac, enter through a garage window a few feet away from a dog's cage, navigate his way through a darkened utility room, grab a butcher knife from the kitchen, and then head into the living room to stab two boys and slice their mother's throat. Although the same could be said for the Idaho homicides case on why somebody would go to a a notorious party house right across the street from from a Greek row at a university. I mean, kind of crazy on a party night. I mean, it's just crazy. Although several neighbors told the police that they had noticed a dark car slowly cruising the area in the weeks before the crime, one even said that the car occasionally stopped near the Routiers' house. Veteran investigators never believed that Darley and her sons were the victims of a random attack by a stranger, nor were they able to find anyone who had a reason to harm them. But if this guy's, if there's a dark car slowly cruising the area in the weeks before the crime, see, I think there was, I think Darley did mention that there was a car following her in the weeks and possibly months before. But again, obviously we're not going to take her word for it. But if multiple different neighbors are telling the police that there was indeed a dark car that slowly cruised the area. One neighbor said that it actually stopped near the roots, specifically near the Routier's house. This is really weird. Yet according to Richard Reyna, a private investigator working for Darley's appellate attorney, Darren Routier admitted last year that in the spring of 96, when his business was in trouble and he was $22,000 in debt, he had asked Darley's stepfather, Bob Key, whether he knew anyone who might break into the family's house as part of an insurance scam. Holy, what is, this is a mind shocking detail. I've actually never heard this before. Wow, let me, let me repeat that again. This is insane. So just last year, would, this would have been 2001, Darren admitted that he asked Darley's stepfather, Bob Key, whether he knew anyone who might break into the family's house as part of an insurance scam. Once the furniture and other items were, in quotations, stolen, Darren would retrieve them from the burglar and pay him out of the proceeds from his insurance claim. A couple of months ago, when I asked Darren if he had made such a statement, he denied it. But a few days later, when I confronted him with affidavits given to me by Darley's stepfather and Reina, he confessed that he had, in fact, talked to Key about faking a burglary. Okay, we are firmly in mind shock land because... How many other cases where a parent is alleged to have killed the children, was there a plot being hatched to fake a burglary? Now, my initial thought now is, first of all, 
what kind of people does Bob Key know and what kind of business is he in? And did he hire somebody to scope out the house? Is that the dark sedan scoping out the house to kind of figure out how they're going to fake this burglary? Did they hire a psychopath who wanted to kill instead of burglarize? Like what, if we're dealing with criminal element, did they simply hire a guy to burglarize that just wanted to kill? Was he a killer? And he took that opportunity to kill and then he disappeared. And does that explain a lot of the guilt and inconsistencies amongst all the family and their assertion that uh, Darley actually is innocent because she is. She didn't kill anybody. And did, maybe she didn't even know. Did she even know about this plot? Maybe she did. Maybe she didn't. You would think somebody would tell her after the fact. But when I asked if he had discussed the plan with anybody else, including a couple of reputed car thieves, in Rowlett, Darren hesitantly replied, quote, there is a possibility I said the same thing in conversation with the people that worked around me. I don't remember what I said, but there's a strong possibility that was on my mind. And in conversation, I could have said that, end quote. Now, is he lying? But then why would he deny saying this? But then he has the affidavits by Darley's stepfather and Raina that they said that he said it. So then he finally admitted it. So he reluctantly admitted this because he initially denied. Only when these other affidavits were presented by the other people. I mean, this is insane. What are the chances, statistically, that he's trying to stage a burglar and it has nothing to do with what happened? Hmm. Because if we, again, I wouldn't take anything from, uh, from biased parties, but apparently neighbors... Now, it's unknown which neighbors, because some of the neighbors supposedly thought she did it, some thought she didn't. It would be curious if the neighbors who thought she did it also admitted to seeing the dark sedan cruising the neighborhood and stopping in front of her house. And they just simply wrote, they didn't deny it, but they wrote it off as coincidental or non-related for whatever reason. <sighs> yeah, th this is really tough. This is really tough because if, the, if he's involved with some kind of criminal element, I mean, this is weird. Were they, so do they normally sleep upstairs? And on that particular night, as fate would have it, they fell asleep watching TV downstairs when they were supposed to be upstairs. Did the burglar freak out that there were people there? Because they were so, because if, if Darren said they all sleep upstairs, so nobody should be downstairs. And if they were woken up by any burglary, he would make sure nobody went downstairs for a certain period of time for the burglar to get away. Or was he not given an exact date on when the burglary would take place? Continuing on with the article here, Darren insisted that he never carried out the plan, and Reyna said he has found no evidence to the contrary. The prosecutors who tried the case against Darley chuckled when I told them about Darren's story, noting that it was suspicious that he would go public just in time for the filing of the writ. They said, but apparently this was known prior and the affidavits were prior. They said that Darley, and, and of course the testimony of the neighbors with the sedan, they said that Darley's lawyers might be using me to get favorable publicity for their client while the court of appeals is considering her case. Anyway, they said, if someone really did break into the house to burglarize it, why didn't he grab some of Darley's jewelry, which was sitting in plain view on the kitchen counter? Why grab only a butcher knife and commit murder? Well, again, what kind of criminal is this? Did they get some, some psychotic to carry out this plot? And he freaked out because there were people in uh, downstairs when they shouldn't have been. And also, is this some kind of weird, curious psycho who was presented with the opportunity of a, of a sleeping woman and children and the jewel is right there on the kitchen counter next to the butcher knife. And he looks at the butcher knife and he decides to, to enact on some morbid curiosities. I mean, we're talking about a criminal here. We're not talking about a regular person. We're talking about somebody who would burglarize someone's house for money. This is clearly not a moral individual. So that it'd be more likely that he could possibly be some kind of psycho than any random person, possibly even more so than Darley, a supposedly loving mother. Dar Darren's reluctant admission certainly raises more questions than it answers, but it also suggests some tantalizing what ifs. If, for instance, Darren's fake burglary scheme had come out before Darley's trial, prosecutors might still have gone after her, but probably would not have sought the death penalty in that would have been a tougher case to make. I mean, how many coincidences are we willing to admit to accept here? Because to me, 
The fact that neighbors, multiple neighbors corroborated a dark sedan scoping out the area and stopping in front of their house. I mean, that's almost as damning as the bloody a fingerprint. I mean, those are criti- those are certainly more more avenues that need to be pursued instead of trying to read into some video of an emotional mother at her children's grave. I mean, come on. Darley's defense lawyers surely would have used that admission to create reasonable doubt as to her involvement, perhaps leading to her acquittal, regardless of whether she was guilty. Most significantly, if Darren's admission leads to additional confessions about a break-in at the Routier house, it could well prove what Darley had been saying all along, that she did not kill her kids. Again, just to reiterate here, what are the chances that the husband is trying to hire people for a fake burglary for insurance? And the, and the mother of his children, the children are murdered and the mother claims there was a burglar. Unless one wants to argue, if Darley was in on it, she took that opportunity to take two children out to kill her two children because she knew there was a planned burglary. And the burglar freaked out and ran away because he wanted no part of that. And he was, a, let's call it an honorable thief, someone who would burglarize but would never kill. I mean, that's, that's really the only scenario that could theoretically explain this, but, but that is, that's almost, that's so out there. I mean, that would have had to be, I mean, when has that ever happened? Not, I mean, again, that doesn't mean it didn't happen here, but it's just so out there in terms of plausibility. If a mother is planning to kill her children, is she going to take the opportunity to, to frame a burglar that her husband is setting up to burglarize the house on an insurance scam? That's a tough one. That's a tough sell right there. Again, I'm not saying it did or didn't happen. This is my shock. I'm not alleging anything is true or untrue, but that that's just a crazy, that would be, I mean, the whole thing's insane. I mean, we are so firmly in mind shock territory right now. I actually was not expecting this level of mind shockery, but let's continue here. The clam pets or Ozzy and Harriet. Every detail of Darley Routier's life has been thoroughly examined by reporters, investigators, lawyers, and cops. Academic treatises on maternal filicide have been reviewed again and again to see if any case compares with hers. Yet, even now, no one has been... I mean, this still doesn't explain the sock, though. Because if the burglar came in to burglarize, why would he have the sock? Why would he drop it in the alley? And where was his getaway car? Or were these burglars smart enough not to actually use the vehicle that they scoped the neighborhood out to actually commit the crime. Yeah, it still doesn't explain the sock, but anyway. Actually, let me, I just thought of something else. If the husband knows that she's innocent and he thinks no one might believe her and she doesn't know about the planned burglary, did the husband, who's doing CPR, did he run out and throw the sock in the alley to try to make sure that his wife wouldn't be found guilty? Did he have that forward thinking? That's almost more plausible than her trying to throw it out there, isn't it? But let's continue here. Yet even now, no one has been able to come up with a plausible explanation as to why she would have stabbed her boys. Unlike Andrea Yates, Darley had no history of mental illness or psychotic hallucinations. Unlike Susan Smith, the South Carolina mother who drove her kids into a lake, she had no abuse or incest in her background. She had no criminal record and was not known to have committed adultery. Born in Pennsylvania, Darley moved to Lubbock as a teenager with her mother and stepfather. She met Darren at Western Sislin, where he worked as a cook. Her own mother waited tables there. The 17-year-old boy was immediately infatuated with the bubbly 15-year-old girl with the frosted hair. She was different than anybody I had ever met, Darren recalled, a trendsetter on her own path. They married four years later in the garden room of his parents' house. He had been voted most likely to succeed at the small high school while he attended on the outskirts of Lubbock and had planned to prove it. After moving to the Dallas area, he started a small company that tested electronic components, and when he began making money in the early 90s, he and Darley cut loose. They bought a $130,000 house, adding marble in the bathroom, white carpet in the dining room, and $12,000 worth of drapes in the living room. Wow. They bought a $600 fountain for the front yard and a $9,000 Redwood Spa for the back. Darren purchased a 30-foot cabin cruiser to use on nearby Lake Ray Hubbard and a 1982 Jaguar to drive to and from work. When Darley's beloved cat died, she spent $800 for a tombstone to put it over its grave at a pet cemetery. 
In 95, Darren's company bought in, brought in about a half a million dollars in gross revenue, and he paid himself an annual salary of $125,000. At the time, we were in the top 2% of the tax bracket for our age, he told me more than once. And they spent every cent they made. Their neighbors thought they were a hoot, Rowlett's version of the clam pets from the Beverly Hillbillies. Darren wore shirts with the sleeves rolled up to show his muscles, grew his hair long in the back, and sported a diamond watch and gold nugget and diamond rings. Darley got size 36 triple D breast implants that she showed off in tight fitting tops, made regular visits to the tanning salon, and wore diamond rings on every finger. She bought a toy Pomeranian with white hair matching her own. Even if they were a little flashy, they were not disliked. One neighbor called them Ozzie and Harriet of the 90s. Darley was known as a cookie baking housewife who always let the neighborhood kids hang out at her house, which they called the Nintendo house because of the elaborate game room that Darren had designed. After her arrest, several of those kids put signs in her front yard proclaiming her innocence. She cooked for neighbors going through hard times and even made a mortgage payment for a neighbor with cancer. Wow. In early 96, Darren's business began to suffer and he got behind on the bills. He was at least a month late on the mortgage and owed $10,000 in back taxes to the IRS and $12,000 on credit cards. But if the financial problems were causing stress in their marriage, no one in the neighborhood saw it. Darren decided to start a second business called Champagne Wishes, in which he would take people around the lake on his boat at sunset while they sipped champagne and, if they wished, used the boat's bedroom. Darren's difficulties didn't seem to concern Darley either. Her shopping never slowed, and she made plans to take a trip that summer to Cancun with some friends. See, that's interesting, too, because the people saying that she did this for either the $10,000 insurance payout or because she was stressed about having no money, if Darren never really told her about their money problems or the extent of which, which many husbands would, would never do, or whether he did or she didn't even care, so she's still spending like crazy on credit, making trips, etc. So if the lifestyle is still there, regardless of the money's there to back it up, I mean, it seems like if she would snap, she would have snapped much later when the lifestyle could no longer be supported. Again, these are just my observations. But people who have actually studied this type of uh, lavish spending and the exact mental breaking points on when it stops, they can chime in here. Continuing on here, but on May 3rd, about a month before the murders, Darley made an unusual entry in her otherwise upbeat diary. Quote, I hope that one day you will forgive me for what I am about to do, she wrote. My life has been such a hard fight for a long time, and I just can't find the strength to keep fighting anymore, end quote. On that day, she considered taking some sleeping pills to kill herself. But she never took them and never finished her diary entry. After talking with her on the phone, Darren became worried and came home to comfort her. At that point, she told me she was ashamed of what she had done and never thought about taking her life again. And another interesting statistics here is uh, women are much more likely to uh, go through the motions of attempting suicide than actually following through on them versus, for example, men who, when they make the decision to kill themselves, they usually follow through much higher percentage than women just another thought here. Also, what are the exact details of that circumstance? Because again, how many people have a story similar to that? I don't know. Darley said her blah feeling, as she put it, was because she hadn't gotten her period in more than a year. When it arrived a few days after her suicidal thoughts, she said her spirit soared. Okay, so was this some kind of hormonal thing? In fact, people who saw her in the weeks that followed said she did not seem particularly despondent. Her old friend, Barbara Jovell, did tell Darley that she should get some counseling or perhaps enter a treatment center, as she herself had done when she once felt suicidal. But Jovell didn't sense that Darley was desperate or self-destructive, and she certainly didn't act differently. In late May, Darley and Darren took the boys to Scarborough Fair, a festival featuring characters dressed in medieval costumes. Darley, flamboyant as always, wore a silky belly dancing outfit. On June 5th, the boys played in the hot tub, and that evening, Damon and Devin huddled under blankets in front of a television Darren had just installed in the living room. Darley and Darren would later say they would later say they stayed up talking past midnight, then kissed each other goodnight. Darren went upstairs to the master bedroom, where Drake, then seven months old, was asleep, while Darley curled up on the couch downstairs next to the two older boys. She had been sleeping on the couch that week, she said, because she wanted to watch over Damon and Devin, who had been spending the night downstairs since school let out. 
and because she was a light sleeper and would sometimes be awakened by Drake turning over in his crib. Okay, so it seems like it was common, or at least since school ended that week, that they were all sleeping on the couch. So it seems like Darren wouldn't have scheduled a burglary if he knew they were sleeping down there, or did they just start doing that? Well, when did school let out? This is June 6th. School doesn't let out that much earlier than that, does it? So was that just a couple days and he was either unaware? I mean, huh. A few hours later, a 911 dispatcher in Rowlett received a frantic call. Somebody came in here, Darley screamed. They just stabbed me and my children. And this photo here, again, of her being arrested, I mean, this just looks like... I mean, is it her being arrested? Taken to Gatesville, February 5th, 97. She's wearing white. Yeah, it looks like it. I mean, she looks so despondent and just uh, meant, I mean, again, could this be a guilty party or is she more likely, I mean, just the level of sadness here is so off the charts here. I mean, barring split personality, I mean, it's, it's, it's real. Yeah, I don't know. It's really tough. Let's continue here. The case against her. The first tip off for the cops was a 911 call. Why in the midst of that craziness did Darley feel the need to tell the dispatcher that she had picked up the butcher's knife, that her fingerprints were on it, and that she hoped they would still be able to get the prints off the attacker? Yeah, that is a little strange because she's already, shouldn't she be, she should be preoccupied emotionally with the fact that her children are dead or dying as opposed to uh, finding their, kill. I mean, Finding their killer, obviously, they would want justice, but usually that's not in the one. I don't know. In the in the second, you'd probably be more preoccupied with your kids. I mean, I don't know. One of the first officers at the scene was also perplexed that Darley didn't tend to her sons, even when he asked her to. Instead, she held a towel to her own neck. Nurses at the hospital where Darley was taken said that when she was told that her sons were dead, she exhibited a flat effect and did not dissolve into hysteria, as other mothers often do upon learning that they have lost their children. Also, if she already kind of knew at the scene, I mean, I don't know. After the murders, Darley gave conflicting accounts of what exactly the intruder had done to her. One officer said she told him that she had struggled with her assailant on the couch. Another officer said she told him the struggle was at the kitchen counter. A friend who talked to Darley while she was in the hospital said Darley told her that she remembered lying on the couch as the man was running the knife over her face. But in her formal written statement to the police, Darley said her only view of the man came as he was walking away from the couch. Well, if, if she was sleeping and she was cut while sleeping and she's drifting in and out of consciousness, I mean, that would all be normal, wouldn't it? I mean, again, just theorizing that's if she's innocent. Like, you could also explain it that way. If she was guilty, I mean, would she make up all these different stories if she was guilty? Again, it's kind of weird because if she's guilty, I, yeah, I don't know. She said she couldn't remember any distinct details about the attack or the killer, except that he was wearing dark clothes and a baseball cap. Here's the other thing, though, too, though. If she was, if she's guilty, wouldn't she make up some fake description? Was it really possible that Darley, who could be awakened by her baby moving in his crib, had slept through the stabbings of her sons a few feet away? Unless, of course, if she was sleeping and the burglar was being really quiet and just came up and slashed her throat first and she was conscious or uh, unconscious or semi-conscious. The cops' suspicions grew when the doctors and nurses who treated Darley told them that her wounds could have been self-inflicted. Then a few, I mean, how many times does someone self-inflict an injury to their own throat? Unless, of course, if she is trying to kill herself, then okay. But Then a few days after leaving the hospital, she showed the police dark bruises that covered her arms from wrist to elbow. Yet the doctors who examined her said the bruises were too fresh to have been inflicted on the night of the attacks. More likely, they said, Darley hit her arms with a blunt instrument after she left the hospital or had someone else do it to convince the police she had been attacked. Okay, this is crazy because if she did not self-inflict these new injuries and bruises... I mean, who did it? Did she find out about the possible burglary and she had a fight with Darren and he did it? Or did the people who organized the burglary, if that's what it was, did they beat her up? After studying the crime scene, the police noticed that the soak, or in, her, in a new emotional state, did she in fact self-inflict those? because she was so stressed out, if she's innocent, about being thought of as guilty, because now she has time to think about everything and realize that they might think she's guilty. 
So even an innocent person, if they're highly emotional, maybe they would do that. Again, I don't know. Someone who loses their children, I mean, you can't expect them to act logically or sanely after that. I mean, that's something you never, I mean, that's just impossible to even think about. It's just so, so tragic and insane. After studying the crime scene, the police noticed that the so-called intruder had apparently got into the house by slashing a window screen that covered a low garage window, then stepping through the slit. Why, the cops asked, didn't the intruder just pull off the screen as burglars normally do? Why did he only slice Darley's throat and stab her in the shoulder and forearm instead of plunging his knife deep into her body the way he plunged it into the bodies of her boys? Why not make sure that Darley was dead so that she would not be able to identify him? Well, the counter argument there is what if he slashed her throat first and he thought that would be enough? And then when it wasn't, and at some point later there was a struggle, that's when the shoulder and arm injuries occurred. Just a thought there again, I don't know. To evaluate the veracity of Darley's story, a forend- especially if this is some kind of crazy lunatic burglar, I mean, you can't expect them to act sanely, especially if maybe this was his first killing. He doesn't know what's going on. To evaluate the veracity of Darley's story, a forensic expert tried to replicate the intruder's series of moves, dropping a bloody knife from waist height into the utility room floor while making his way toward the garage door. The blood spattered across the floor in a pattern that looked entirely different from the little pools found in the utility room the night of the murders. When a chemical called luminol was sprayed around the kitchen to reveal traces of blood not visible to the naked eye, blood stains were discovered in the sink, the kind that would be consistent with someone washing off blood off his or her hands. There was also an indication, well, how do they know the burglar didn't wipe his hands in the sink? The kind that would be consistent with someone washing blood off his or her hands, there was also an indication that some of Darley's blood around the sink had been wiped up with a towel. In her various statements to the police, she had never mentioned standing by the sink. Was it possible that she had cut her own throat at the sink and then tried to wipe up the blood? When another blood expert found tiny drops of the boy's blood on the back of the Victoria's Secret nightshirt that Darley had worn that evening, he remarked that a likely way the blood could have gotten there was when it dripped off the butcher knife and onto Darley's back as she was raising her arm above her while stabbing the boys. Wasn't she curled up with them, though? So if anybody was stabbing the boys, blood would, how, I mean, wouldn't blood drops go everywhere? Then Charles Lynch, Dallas County's premier trace evidence analyst, dropped a bombshell. He said that he had found a bread knife in the kitchen that contained a nearly invisible fiber, 60 microns long, made of fiberglass coated with rubber. Under a microscope, Lynch had determined that the fiber found on the bread knife looked exactly like the fiberglass in the window screen cut by the intruder. Was this the knife used to cut the screen? If so, only someone already inside the house could have cut it. And because Darren's story that he had run downstairs and given CPR to Devin until an officer arrived was consistent with the physical evidence, the police were left with a single suspect, Darley. That's interesting. Dallas County's premier trace evidence analyst. Okay. Now here's my question. If the police had tunnel vision and they needed something to secure a conviction, would they have planted that? Would they have taken the knife and and cut the screen and put it back and and then found it, so-called found it? Again, anybody unfamiliar with how police corruption works, again, that doesn't mean they thought she was innocent. Maybe they really did think she did it and they just needed that home run. And this is what they went with instead of uh, trying to figure out the bloody fingerprint and trace the black sedan. The case against the case against her. There was just one problem. On the night of the murders, one of Darren's socks was found down a back alley some 75 yards away from the house. It contained two small spots of blood from David and Devin, but none of Darley's blood. What was the sock doing there? Police initially speculated that Darley had carried the sock three houses away to make it look as if the intruder had dropped it during his escape. But they could find none of Darley's blood or anyone else's blood outside the house. There was no blood on the back patio or the back fence or in the back alley. If Darley had planted the sock, how could she avoid leaving a trail of her own? Once her throat was cut, she lost significant amounts of blood. The detectives and the pro- and also just losing that much blood and the stress of what was going on. And I mean, just the severe trauma, even without all the injuries, just the severe trauma could definitely cause some memory issues. The detectives and the prosecutors came up with an interesting theory. Darley stabbed her boys to death, ran the sock down the alley, perhaps to give the impression that the intruder had used it to keep his prints off the knife. 
then cut herself at the kitchen sink. Either before she stabbed the boys or before she stabbed herself, she cut the window screen with the bread knife. Once all that was done, she called for Darren and then called 911. But if Darley wanted the cops to find the sock, wouldn't she have thrown it closer to the house? Perhaps at the end of the driveway, instead of leaving it so far away next to a garbage can where the police might have overlooked it. Okay, so... And wouldn't she have doused the sock in blood so the police would know what they had found? Okay, yeah, this is even more suspicious because, yeah, why do that? Because if it's a sock that doesn't even have visible traces of blood and it was put right next to a trash can, where, why, and 75 yards away, not right next to the house, that could easily be overlooked. And even then, would Darley have had time to do everything before the police arrived? Records indicate that Darley was on the phone with the 911 dispatcher for five minutes and 44 seconds. Just as that call was ending, a police officer came into the house and was there for at least a minute before paramedics arrived. The paramedics found Damon still breathing. He died shortly after. Why is that important? According to a doctor who studied the severity and location of Damon's stab wounds, the boy could not have lived longer than nine minutes once he was stabbed and properly probably live no more than six minutes. Let's assume he lived nine minutes. If you subtract from that nine minutes, her five minute and 44 second phone call to 911, then subtract the additional minute and 10 seconds that she was in the presence of a police officer. Darley had only two minutes and six seconds to stab her sons, head for the garage, step through the slit in the window, jump a fence back or go through the back gate, run barefoot for 75 yards down an alley, drop a bloody sock, run 75 yards back, stab herself, clean up the blood around the sink, and stage whatever crime scene there was left to be staged. The prosecutors did not have a good answer to the timeline conundrum except to say that the doctor was simply guessing about the nine minutes it took Damon to die. Shouldn't they have gotten like a whole bunch of second opinions to see what everybody thought about that? And even that Darley could have had enough time to commit the murders and stage the crime scene. But if she was smart enough to plant fake evidence, wouldn't she have already been ready with a more believable story about what the intruder looked like and how the killings occurred? That's a great point. Would she have been so stupid as to tell the police that she had slept through the attacks and that she could not remember what happened? If Darley is indeed a calculating murderer, wouldn't she have made sure both boys were dead before she called 911 so they could not finger her as the attacker? Wouldn't she also have made sure to get rid of her diary so that the cops wouldn't see her suicidal musings? Wouldn't she may have made sure to weep at the hospital so that the nurses would see the depth of her grief? And when she went to the cemetery on Devin's birthday in the presence of television cameras, wouldn't she have made sure to turn on the tears instead of singing and spraying silly string? What really made no sense was why she chose Damon and Devin to kill. If Darley, as the cops and prosecutors believed, had become increasingly upset about money, why didn't she murder Darren and cash in his $800,000 life insurance policy? The policies on Damon and Devin totaled only $10,000, and their funerals alone cost more than $14,000. If she was overwhelmed by the stresses of motherhood, another theory, then why didn't she also kill Drake, the baby, who required most of her attention? I actually, even though I am leaning innocent here, I, I already explained the the explanations for those because if she really was planning to kill all of them and then for whatever reason she stopped midway through that could explain that at her trial darley's lawyer doug Mulder, one of dallas's most prominent and charismatic criminal defense attorneys kept asking the jurors if they really believed that a doting mother could in the course of a single summer night pop popcorn for her boys watch a movie with them and then suddenly snap and turn into a knife wielding nut a psychiatrist who had interviewed Darley for 14 hours after her arrest said she was telling the truth about her attacks, about the attacks, and that her loss of memory about certain details was the result of traumatic amnesia, which can occur following emotionally overwhelming events. I would also think that for maybe simple people, now I'm not saying she's simple, but if she is a simple Texas bleached blonde girl, perhaps the chances of her being able to mentally cope with such a tragedy, like the chances of that are lower than a different individual. And she'd be more likely to have memory loss because of the trauma. Also, it'd be interesting to get more opinions from different psychiatrists. But this is the main psychiatrist, the first or the first main one who interviewed her for 14 hours, said she was telling the truth. That's interesting. Obviously, a brain fingerprint scan would solve all these problems. Vincent DeMaio, the chief medical examiner in San Antonio and the editor-in-chief of the prestigious Journal of Forensic Medicine Pathology, testified that her injuries were not at all consistent with the self-inflicted wounds he had seen in the past. So this guy's not a random nobody. He's the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Forensic Medical Pathology, saying that her wounds are not medically uh, self-inflicted. 
He said that the cut across her throat in particular was hardly superficial, as the prosecutors alleged. Mulder produced notes taken by the nurses at the hospital that said Darlie was tearful, frightened, crying, visibly upset, and very emotional on the night that she was brought in. It would also be curious if there were security cameras in the hospital at that time. I mean, this is mid-90s, so maybe... Mulder produced notes taken by the nurses. Okay. Finally, Darley herself took the stand, explaining that she had stood at the kitchen sink to wet towels and placed them on her children's wounds, and that the silly string scene was her heartfelt way of wishing a happy birthday to Devin, who she hoped was watching from heaven. And again, if she is this simple blonde and she's not really thinking about how this all looks, that's actually a very plausible explanation. Darley, however, was not a persuasive witness. She cried at odd times and became far too defensive under the cross-examination of Toby Shook, the veteran Dallas County prosecutor who kept slamming her for what he called her selective amnesia. One of the prosecution's expert witnesses aggressively promoted the theory that Darley was guilty, and in the end, the evidence, however circumstantial, was too much for the jurors, even if they could never figure out how the bloody sock got down the alley. I mean, the details about the sock barely having any blood on it and being so far away and placed next to the trash... That's tough. That's tough. During their deliberations, they watched the Silly String video a reported seven times. So that's what they're just watching the whole time this is, instead of fixating on the unidentified bloody print and the black sedan. Perhaps Mulder made a mistake in not introducing another videotape secretly recorded by the police that showed Darley weeping over her son's graves. Perhaps the outcome would have been different had he found more expert witnesses to counter the prosecution's experts. But even then, it's hard to see how a jury would have gotten over the finely honed image of Darley as a mentally unbalanced, gum-chewing, bleach blonde who seemed to be unmoved, if not outright exhilarated, over the deaths of her children. See, here's the thing. Again, to me, to me, I'm definitely leaning innocence now. But if this is more of a, pardon the uh, expression here, airhead bleached blonde chewing gum, how many of those actually turn out to be cold, sadistic murders? It's usually the seemingly quiet and not boisterous housewives that end up like this. Again, doesn't mean she's innocent in any way. It just That just makes me lean a particular way because all these things can be explained away. And then we have the unidentified bloody fingerprint and the black sedan and the admissions of the husbands that he's planning a staged robbery for insurance money. Scenarios. In the years since Darley's conviction, various well-wishers have attempted to prove her innocence. A writer in the Dallas suburb of Louisville who published a book on the case told reporters that he believed the killer was the son of a Rowlett police detective. See, that would explain some things with the investigation, wouldn't it? Especially if the bread knife, uh, if the fibers from the screen were planted on the bread knife. A Waco millionaire, Brian Pardo, reportedly spent $100,000 on an independent investigation of the murders, conducting handwriting analyses and other tests on Darley. He also persuaded Darren to take a lie detector test administered by a Waco police officer. Pardo told reporters that Darren was shown to be lying when he answered no to four questions. Was he involved in any plan to commit a crime at his house on June 6, 96? Did he stab Darley? Did he know who planted the sock in the alley? Could he name the person who stabbed Darley? Wow. I mean, I would expect him to fail the first one because he's denying the burglary, but he failed stabbing Darley, knowing who planted the sock in the alley, and naming the person who stabbed Darley. Darren did not deny that he failed the test but told me that he was being manipulated by the examiner who had spent two hours upsetting him with a million questions about the murders before hooking up to the polygraph. Okay, I mean, maybe. Again, brain fingerprint scan's the way to go here, so we'd have to deal with that. Darren also speculated that he was suffering from survivor's guilt in which he envisioned himself at the scene trying to help the kids, but was unable to reach them. According to knowledgeable sources, Darley, too, was given a lie detector test by one of her original court-appointed attorneys. The attorney refuses to comment on the results, which have never been made public. That's curious, but here's why that doesn't mean anything. Because 
the damp maybe she's innocent of the da- of the really damning questions but she failed a couple of other questions which make her look guilty in a different way in which case they wouldn't want to release that or of course she either failed all of them you would think if she passed absolutely all of them the defense would want to release that unless there's some kind of unless they're saving it for the appeal and they don't want to really i mean i don't know what the strategy could be there but again, brain fingerprint scan, obviously the way to go. Polygraph tests are not admissible in court, so they proved of no value to Darley's court-appointed appellate attorney, Stephen Cooper. But Darren intrigued him. Beginning in 98, operating out of a cluttered office near downtown Dallas, Cooper gulped down coffee and smoked cigarettes as he worked nonstop on the case, eventually covering his floor with more than 25 boxes of Darley-related files. Last year, Cooper filed his first brief with the Court of Criminal Appeals to get Darley a new trial. Among his many claims, conflict of interest, by Doug Mulder. Cooper said Mulder should have raised questions before the jury about Darren's potential involvement in the murders, but couldn't because for a single day before taking on Darley as a client, he had represented Darren and Darley's mother at a pretrial hearing over a gag order. Cooper alleged that Mulder could have learned something from Darren about what had really happened that night, but was unable to use it because of loyalty to a former client. Wow, these are serious conflicts of interest. I mean, this is a complete mistrial here. I mean, this is insane. This is important, according to Cooper's brief, because Darren was a plausible suspect. He not only had a pecuniary motive to get rid of Darley, her life insurance policy cashed out at two hundred dollars to $250,000, but he had the means and the opportunity to commit the crime. Darren, said Cooper, could have slashed the window screen and then carried the sock out to the alley without leaving a blood trail because he had not been stabbed himself. Or he could have done that first if he was planning it all along. Mulder recently told me that he had represented Darren for less than an hour that day and that Darren had told him nothing about the murders. Mulder said that he would have quickly and happily pointed the finger at Darren, but that every time he asked Darley if her attacker could possibly have been her husband, she said absolutely not. And again, is that because she's simple and she just doesn't want to believe that it's a possibility and it's too much for her mind to handle, so she convinced herself that it wasn't him, even if it was and she saw his face. And possibly Darren realized that, so there was no need to finish the job, maybe? I don't know. Hmm. Or, of course, he just hired somebody else. Did he? Okay, hold on a second. So Darren admitted to possibly wanting to do this fake burglary. What did he not admit to? Was it more than a burglary? Was he hired? Did he possibly want to hire someone to kill her as well? Because her life insurance policy is big. I mean, why would he kill his own kids either only for $10,000? Her life insurance policy is two hundred dollars to $250,000. I mean, that could possibly get them out of trouble. $10,000 wouldn't do anything. Huh. I asked Mulder if he had ever heard a rumor while preparing for trial that Darren was looking for someone to burglarize the house before the murders. Never, he said. But according to the affidavit given to be my darling stepfather, Bob Key, Darren said in the spring of 96 that he had a plan in which he and his family would be gone from the house and that a burglar hired by him would pull up with a U-Haul, remove household items, and keep them hidden until the insurance company paid the claim. All that was needed, Darren said, was someone to do the job. The soft-spoken Key, who lives with Darley's mother on a small farm east of Dallas, told me that when the murders first happened, his conversation with Darren never crossed my mind. When I asked him why he didn't later get the information into the hands of Darley's lawyers, he said, I don't have a good answer to that other than, I don't know. Huh. Maybe he didn't want to get Darren in trouble, or maybe, as implausible as it seems, he failed to make a connection between Darren's plan and the murders. I mean, how is that possible? Darley's mother, Darley Key, told me that she had never wanted to consider the possibility that Darren was involved. She loved him like a son. But in March 2000, after Darren seemed to be getting increasingly upset over questions from Richard Reyna, Cooper's PI, she began to have second thoughts. And her husband told her for the first time the particulars of his long ago conversation with Darren. She immediately called Stephen Cooper. Here's a quick counterpoint, though, because if the PI, if Darren feels like the PI is now setting him up to be the fall guy, he could possibly be getting upset with that because he knows it's not true. So that's not necessarily damning in his direction. Could Darley's husband, mother, and stepfather be making the whole thing up to get her a new trial? Raina grilled Darren repeatedly about the story and said he believes Darren was looking for someone to hire. He said he even got Darren to admit to him 
that he worked out another scam a couple of years before the murders in which he had his car stolen so he could collect the insurance money. Wow. Darren told me that he did not arrange for his Jaguar to be stolen, but he admitted saying to the person who he believed eventually stole the car, it wouldn't bother me if it was gone. Wait, what? So he's saying he didn't, wait, okay. What the heck does that mean? So is that like some weird suggestion to a car thief? It wouldn't bother me if my car was gone and then the car goes missing. So is he telling the truth in the sense that he didn't say directly, steal my car for insurance money? He just said, yeah, it wouldn't bother me if the car was gone. That's really weird. And he admitted that. Okay. If Darren's fake, okay. Darren would not deny to me that the person who broke into his house and murdered his sons could have been someone who had heard him discuss his would-be insurance scam. But he said he had no idea who that person might be. And if such a crime did happen, it was without his assistance. Why would I do that if I had kept my kids and wife downstairs, he said. That's the craziest story I've ever heard. When I told him that the complete truth might help him, his wife get a new trial, he insisted he wanted to do what he could for Darley. But I don't want to end up with some kind of BS charges brought against me either, he said. I don't want to help her at the expense of my life. This is in quotations. Huh. You know, it's weird, though. What if he thought they weren't going to be downstairs, though? That's the thing. And then also, what if there wasn't an exact plan? Like there wasn't an exact date he had discussed it. And also, what if he went to some kind of organized crime element? I mean, he still has his own life to worry about and the surviving son. So at this point, would he really blow the whistle on some organized crime if he thinks they would retaliate and kill him and his other son? Because his, you know, his two older sons, they're gone just to get his wife out of out of jail and he believes they might kill her again anyway and him and his other son would he be, keep quiet about some kind of organized crime connection reina said he wonders if darren is holding back even more secrets after interviewing both darren and darley he got the idea that darren might have hired someone to kill her he said darley told him that she had been threatening to divorce darren a fact that has never been made public he said Darren was once so upset over Darley's threat of divorce that he had put a pistol to his head. Was it possible that Darren had decided that if he was going to lose Darley, he wasn't going to let anyone else have her? Darley told me she was never serious about divorcing Darren. Only once, added Darren, did she pack a suitcase and spend the night with a girlfriend, quote, because she thought I was working too much and not showing her enough attention, end quote. Again, this is probably not unusual in all of the millions and tens of millions of housewives out there. You know, there's probably a lot that have done that at least once. The pistol incident, which Darren characterized as dramatic BS to get her attention, like she does to me all the time, happened two full years before the murders. Me and Darley, we've had our spats, but it's never been serious, Darren said. I've never hit her. I've never cheated on her. When I asked him about Raina's suggestion that he would want Darley killed, Darren replied in a disgusted tone of voice that's completely false and ridiculous. Here's where the what ifs come into play. What if Darren is lying and really did hire someone to kill Darley? Once he realized Damon and Devin were sleeping downstairs a few feet from their mother, wouldn't he have called the thing off rather than risk the lives of his sons? Well, here's the thing. What if whoever he was dealing with didn't give him a date? So he didn't know when it was going to happen. So he didn't know that she would have been with the other sons. And who knows? I mean, we don't know what happened behind the scenes. If this is not organized crime and just some random criminals, how do we know Darren didn't hunt them down and kill them for killing his sons as well? We don't know any of that. But here's the final mind shocks here. This is Forensic Files now.com july 6 2018 article drake routier four things to know about darley routier's son and there are some clues here despite the upheaval of the murders of brothers damon and devon routier and the imprisonment of the mother for homicide drake routier grew into the most adaptable kid i've ever seen his father darren told reporter liz stevens who wrote about the routiers in a fort worth star telegram article the article, published when Drake was two years old, described him as a normal, lively, and resembling his model, mother with startled blue eyes and a delicate mouth. Now, in his early 20s, Drake has beaten the odds in a number of ways. In an on-camera CNN interview, he doesn't act like a young man who's consumed with bitterness or anger, and he apparently has stated of trouble with the law. 
No small accomplishment in an age when the children of politicians and celebrities tend to pop up on mugshots.com. Drake has said he believes in his mother's innocence, and he has visited Darley 48 regularly in the Mountain View unit, where she's one of six women on death row in a state with the most active execution chamber in the U.S. Here are five realities drawn from internet research about his life. Reality number one, Drake's father, Darren Routier, didn't take custody of him right away after the murders because he wanted to get his finances in order. Liz Stevens reported, after putting Darley in jail with bail set at $1 million, the state of Texas placed baby Drake in a foster home in 96. A court later gave custody to his father's parents, Cyrilda and Leonard Routier. Meanwhile, Darren, once a successful computer hardware entrepreneur, lost the family's huge Georgian-style house, cabin cruiser, and his 1986 Jaguar. He started over in Lubbock and eventually had Drake move in with him. See, is this a red flag? Because they're not. he's not even... How are the relatives not getting him? Like, would a father allow his son to go into foster care? This is weird to me. This is really weird. Reality two, Drake found out in 2013 he had acute lymphocytic leukemia, which is the most common type of cancer in children, and treatments result in a good chance for a cure, according to the Mayo Clinic. On October 13, 2016, Drake finished his last cancer treatment at the Children's Medical Hospital in Dallas, according to a message his maternal grandmother posted online. An AP story dated June 18, 2018, reported that Drake was in remission, according to Richard A. Smith, a defense lawyer for his mother. Reality three, Drake told CNN he's had to accept his identity as the kid whose mother is on death row. Darley and other family members have been denigrated in the media ever since her arrest 11 days after the murders. During the trial, prosecutor attorneys labeled Routier's relatives trailer trash and portrayed the Rowlett couple as a tacky nouveau rich with twisted priorities, according to the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. The public chimed in to a pawn shop clerk noted that Darley often came to her store brawless and used foul language, the newspaper reported. Wow, I mean, was this case really just tried in the media? Because who gives a crap about any of that? A lot of people do that. Reality number four, Drake's visits to his mother, who's been on death row for 21 years, take place with a sheet of glass between them. In addition to denying friends and family members physical contact with death row inmates, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice limits visits to two hours in duration that encourages conservative dressing. For example, visitors past the age of adolescence cannot wear shorts or skirts shorter than three inches above the knee. Reality number five, although deprived of his mother's embrace, Drake has grown up with many other people who love him. For instance, Jerry Dale Jackson, the father of Darren Routier's girlfriend, Cindy, considered Drake to be his own. Jackson's obituary in the Weather for Democrat in 2017 listed Drake as one of his grandchildren. Okay, so this is pretty weird. Now, if she's innocent, I mean, how much money would she be owed for all this? Not even allowed to embrace her surviving son. I mean, that's unconscionable. I mean, this is, yeah, this is really weird. A mother uh, actually commented here regarding the knife on why she picked up the knife if it was close to the children. It's a natural instinct for a mother to get any knife away from the kid. So she wouldn't necessarily think about getting her fingerprints on it until after she was calling the police and she realized what she had done. And possibly, I mean, of course, he could have been wearing gloves, but then what's the other bloody fingerprint about? Another interesting thought here, too, like if she planted the sock, wouldn't, couldn't, why didn't she take the jewelry from the kitchen counter as well and just toss it somewhere or bury it? Like if she can run 75 yards... Why not toss it? I mean, yeah, I don't know. Or run another 50 yards and put it in someone's trash. They're not going to go through everybody's trash. Or did they? I mean, you would think they wouldn't go through 50 neighbors' trash randomly. So, I mean, she could have easily got rid of the jewelry if she was staging it to make it look like a burglary. Another commenter is talking about the dog domain. They're dog who supposedly barks a lot never barked and supposedly there were motion lights and allegedly the motion lights never got turned on so was is this a case of if again darren is did, did darren disable them but then why didn't the dog bark huh hmm yeah there's so many unanswered questions here 
Another point is that the uh, the routiers invited the local news crew to the cemetery to film them. Huh. In exchange for airfare for relatives or interviews? Huh. So there's a few different tapes, though. Was that the solemn one? The Gravestart Party was filmed by the local news crew, but apparently that's not the same tape. Rowlett PD placed surveillance equipment in the cemetery, so there might have been a few different tapes. Other people are speculating that if, if Darren is dealing with some unsavory characters, possibly also using drugs, possibly meth heads, who knows what they would do? Would they kill people? Would they even know what was going on? If he's dealing with really low-end criminals who are not professionals, is this the kind of result we get? Also, if it was Darren, possibly he had another accomplice and it was scheduled for that night, and who knows how that possibly could have gotten botched. A commenter mentioned that there was a the dog there was a dog track, and that's what led them to the sock. They didn't randomly see it. And they lost the trail right there. And they were speculating that that's where the vehicle, the burglar and or killer, whoever the perpetrator was, he left at a car parked not far from the, the sock. Huh. Here's a comment from Robert. Very interesting. We'll close this episode out with this comment. I grew up living next door to Darren's parents in Lubbock. Very nice people. My brother and I used to play with Devin and Damon when they'd come to town. I remember it always kind of annoyed us because they were younger than us, and well, you know how kids are. After the murders, Drake moved in next door and became an honorary part of our family. We always had baby Drake with us, whether it be to babysit him or just go next door and get him for a while because we loved him and wanted to see him. I was 12 or so when the murders happened. Obviously, because I lived next door to the Routiers, my thoughts on the case have always been heavily influenced on the side of her being not guilty, and due to personal involvement with the family, certainly hope that she isn't guilty. But here it is, well over 20 years later, and I find myself on the fence. I think in my heart of hearts, if I'm completely honest with myself, I believe she's probably guilty, but because of all the circumstances and the way I grew up so personally close to the family, I can't seem to stop being on Team Darley. But it's probably due to hope. Anyways, I know this comment probably isn't very helpful or incitive or insightful on any facts pertaining to the case I just wanted to share. Haven't seen Drake in years, and he no doubt doesn't even remember me. But if he ever reads this, know that at one time in your life, we saw each other almost every day, and I loved you like a baby brother. Keep kicking your cancer's ass, Bubba, and hope and pray that life brings you as much happiness that is absolutely possible. And just for some assurance that I'm not making this up, tell grandmommy who lived next door in the red brick two-story house with a guest house in the backyard that Robert says hi and wishes her her and all of you my best. You know what's curious too? Is this a case of overcompensation? Because it's someone who's smart enough to realize that they're biased. I mean, that's a rare thing. So he's trying to, is he overcompensating in the other direction that she might be guilty because he knows he's biased? Again, that was just an interesting comment because I haven't seen something like that. I mean, this case has things that are just not seen in any other case. So lots to think about. I might do a follow-up episode if there's uh, more info here. I think we went over quite a lot. This might be the most comprehensive and exhaustive podcast on this case. We did it in typical mind shock fashion with logic and, the, and reason at the forefront, trying to go through every single possible theory. All the mind shock listeners, let me know if I've left out anything or if you have your own theories, thoughts, debunkings, or rebuttals of any kind in the comments section. As always, if you want to help support the podcast, you donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. You can also become a member for access to exclusive streams and chats right here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe, like, and share Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. And of course, if you're not getting notifications, just like more videos and leave plenty of comments and you should get them. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time.
you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. You are listening to Mind Shock True Crime. This is your host, Bruce McGuire. This is Darley Routier, Episode 2, Reasonable Doubt. And we will go over even more mind-shocking information and revelations that is not typically covered in mainstream articles. Is there more than meets the eye to the enigmatic Darley Routier case? That has some strange oddities that you don't see in other cases. A very, very perplexing case, which we will, of course, cover in typical mind shock fashion with logic and reason at the forefront. If you want to help support the podcast, find it interesting and informative, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube for access to exclusive streams and chats. Like and share Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, co podcast requests. You could also be a guest in the podcast depending on your tier. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that bell for notifications. If you're still not getting notifications, just comment more. That seems to be the way the YouTube algorithm works works and any kind of questions rebuttals or debunkings of any kind the comment section is open so let's head over to the justice for juveniles wordpress blog which has some very very interesting write-ups regarding this case Obviously, if you haven't checked out episode one, make sure you check out episode one. We go over all of the details and then start the deep dive, which we'll continue right now. So this was posted on the Justice for Juveniles WordPress blog, August 21st, 2012. Doubt in the Darley Routier case, the timeline. As previously discussed, Darley Routier is on death row in Texas. She has been there for 15 years. She was accused and convicted of murdering her five-year-old son, Damon. She was charged but never tried in the death of her oldest son, Devin. There is a growing body of evidence suggesting there was a rush to judgment in this case, one that could result in the execution of an innocent woman. That is, unless something is done to stop it. The most important consideration in Darley Routier's case is the timeline. The prosecution's case against Darley was circumstantial, resting entirely on the notion that she staged the crime scene in a very short amount of time to mislead investigators. In earlier articles, we looked at the fingerprint evidence in this case, as well as the strange occurrences before, during, and after. This, I'm, I'll be going over those next. This article will focus on the timeline immediately surrounding the murders. The information provided in this timeline description comes from testimony given by the medical examiner, Janice Townsend Parchman, the first two police officers on the scene, and paramedics who responded to the 911 call. The information can be verified through court transcripts. Darley's testimony was not used to support the timeline. Instead, I used a conversation recorded on the 911 tape to verify Darley's words and actions, as well as testimony given by others who were present at the time each event occurred. The 911 call is the basis for the timeline since it was recorded and provides a second-by-second -second description of what was happening in the Routier home for almost six minutes. Testimony is used in to fill in the gaps and provide information about what happened in the minutes after the 911 call ended. The timeline. June 6th, 1996. Interesting date. I went over that in episode one. Darren Routier, Darley's husband, reported he was asleep in the upstairs bedroom when he was suddenly awakened. Darley was sleeping on the couch in the family room. Devin 6 and Damon 5 were sleeping on the floor in the family room in front of the television. Police would later testify that upon arriving at the scene, the television was still on. According to the statement Darren gave to the police, he woke up because he heard a noise and then Darley screaming loud. He reportedly ran down the stairs and went into the living room. He spotted Devin on the floor and the coffee table tipped over. He went down to Devin and knelt down to investigate whether he was hurt. Darren testified at trial that upon coming down the stairs, Darley went straight to the phone into the kitchen sink to get towels. We will now examine the timeline on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. 2.30 a.m. Darley's call to 911 began with her screaming, Somebody came in. She went on to tell the dispatcher that she and her children had been stabbed. Based on the transcript of the 911 call, Darren's voice is heard 30 seconds into the call. At the 55-second mark, Darley asks frantically, Oh my God, what do we do? 
The dispatcher did not respond because she was calling for assistance over the radio. Darren testified that upon discovering Devin with gashes in his chest, he began to perform CPR. Darren explained that D Darley was running back and forth from the kitchen over to Damon, and then she came over to Devin. When asked what she was doing in the kitchen, she answered getting towels. He described her as, quote, trying to stop the bleeding and trying to hold his chest together, end quote. Referring to the couple's oldest child, Devin. Officer Waddle was 1.9 miles from the Routier home. Lieutenant Walling, Waddle and Walling, was 3.1 miles from the home. Both received the call regarding the emergency at the Routier home and began driving toward the house. Paramedics were also alerted. This is confirmed through testimony. 2.31 a.m., one minute and seven seconds into the 911 call, Darley is heard talking to Damon. She says, Damon, hold on, honey. She is again heard speaking to Damon one minute and 48 seconds into the call. She said something unintelligible, followed by what sounded like, do you want, honey, hold on. The dispatcher responded by stating she could not understand what Darley was saying. Darley replied, I'm talking to my babies they're dying. Darren can still be heard speaking into the background of the 911 tape. 2.32 a.m., two minutes and 20 seconds into the call, Darley is heard speaking to Damon. She said, hold on, honey, hold on. Darren is also heard in the background of the 911 call during this time frame. 2.33 a.m. In testimony, Darren depicted the arrival of the first officer, David Waddell, on the scene, Darren and Waddle gave slightly different accounts in that Darren implied the officer came to the door, but Waddle testified to seeing Darren in front of the house. Waddle explained the two met in the yard by the fountain and then went into the house. Waddle's arrival is confirmed through the 911 recording. Three minutes and 45 seconds into the call, a police officer's voice is identified. He is heard saying, look for a rag. Darren testified the officer froze and stopped moving once he entered the home and observed what had happened there. Waddle would later testify that he asked Darley repeatedly to help her son. He would say that each time he asked, she refused. This is not supported by the 911 call. I mean, see, again, do we have a conspiracy afoot here? Because obviously police... Unfortunately, in certain cases, they're more focused on closing the case, not necessarily doing everything by the letter of the law, especially if they truly believe that it's the guilty party that they're skirting around the law to convict. So if they're lying because they, they think that she really did do it in their mind, perhaps that's justifiable. Now, what if she really didn't do it? Well, then, of course, that's a problem. But if the police officers are lying here, I mean, th this is kind of weird. Moreover, it is important to note that while Dali was on the phone, she was carrying on conversations with multiple people, sounding as though she were completely panicked. She is heard speaking to Damon, Darren, the police officer, and the dispatcher throughout the entire call. In fact, three minutes, 48 seconds into the call, Waddle is heard saying, lay down, okay, just sit down. He had a very short window of time where he could have been asking Darley, who her, was herself injured, to tender aid to Damon. However, he is not heard doing this. He is instead heard directing Darley to sit down. It is unknown exactly why Waddle failed to provide medical aid to Damon upon arriving as he testified the child was alive, moving, gasping for air, and looking around the room. Additionally, Waddle testified that he did not go into the garage where Darley informed him a person had fled. His testimony supports Darren's claim that he stood there in the home waiting for backup. This is kind of weird. So the officer did nothing. He just went in and froze and then told Darley to sit down. If that's true, and again, I'm not alleging it is. This is mind shock, where the motto is, the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure. I wasn't there, so I'm not going to hallucinate and pretend to know what did or did not happen. I do not claim anything is true or untrue. However, if an officer did freeze, possibly let a perpetrator get away and let a kid die, then perhaps... He would have motivation to not make himself look that bad at trial. Wouldn't be the first time a police officer or a per someone in a position of perceived authority has done such a thing.
to cover for themselves. Not rocket science. It does happen. I'm not saying it happened here. But if that was the case, that could explain the testimony. 2.34 a.m. Within four minutes into the 911 call, Darley begins to sound even more desperate. In the span of a minute, she asked the dispatcher twice about the ambulance and when it would arrive. She pleaded to the dispatcher, they're barely breathing. If they don't get here, they're going to be dead. Darren is heard during this time frame saying, they took, they ran. Huh. Interesting. Four minutes and 18 seconds into the call, the dispatcher tells Darley there is a police officer at the front door. Waddle is already in the home at this time because his voice has been identified on the 911 tape during the later part of the third minute. The police officer at the door was likely Lieutenant Walling because he testified to arriving at the home in around this time frame. If true, it means that Waddle was in the home for approximately 46 seconds before Walling arrived. During that time, Darley was still on the phone with 901 and was attempting to provide detail to the officer about what happened. Paramedic Jack Colby testified that when he arrived at the home, one officer was already there and another was directly behind him. In testimony, the paramedic identified the officer that came right after him as Walling. Colby explained that the paramedics waited just under two minutes before going into the home because they were waiting for the officer to secure the scene. Wow. That's tragic. Would that two minutes have made a difference? Maybe, maybe not. And why didn't the first officer, Waddle or Waddell, whatever his name is, he didn't even check the garage to see if there was a, a threat in the area? I mean, what is going on here? 2.35 a.m. Darren's voice is not heard during the remainder of the call. However, Darley is heard on the 911 tape saying, somebody who did it intentionally walked in here and did it, Darren. This implies that Darren was in the area when she made the statement. I'll, uh, let's dissect the statement, though, because somebody who did it intentionally walked in here and did it, Darren. Wow. What's the context behind that? Does she know that there was some kind of robbery to be staged? I mean, what's the connotation here? Huh. As if it wasn't an accident. Somebody who did it intent. I mean, obviously it's not an accident, but intentionally wanted to kill them, not just specifically burglarize? Is, what's the context behind this statement here? Five minutes, 33 seconds into the call, the dispatcher asked if the police officer is there. Darley says yes. The dispatcher then tells her to go talk to the officer. The dispatcher does not realize that Darley has been carrying on multiple conversations at the same time throughout the call. 2.36 a.m. Walling entered the backyard to secure it according to his testimony. 2.37 to 2.38 a.m., within this time frame, the paramedics were given the approval to enter the home. Kobai went straight to Damon. He attended to Damon for two minutes inside the home before moving him into the ambulance because it was too chaotic in the home. He stated that Damon was still barely alive when he got to him. He testified that Damon gasped for air as he turned him over. When he was with Damon, he observed the light begin to go out of his eyes. Obviously, uh... I mean, this is kind of tough to read. I actually don't even want to listen to the call because of this. So I will just be dissecting it based off of this. If there is an error or inaccuracy, some anybody, obviously, all the listeners can comment about that. Further discussion. It is critical to note that the activities surrounding the 911 call for two reasons. First, the prosecution claimed that Darley murdered her two children, cut her neck, cut her arm, tried to clean up in the kitchen, deposited a sock several houses away in an alley, returned to the home to break a glass, and then screamed for help. Second, the prosecution painted Darley as a cold-blooded killer who was not the least bit concerned with the welfare of her children. The 911 call disproves the latter, but what does it say about the staging? Let's look at one of the medical examiner's testimony. Dr. Janice Townsend Parchman testified at Darley's trial. One of the topics she provided an expert opinion on was the length of time Damon Routier could have survived his injuries. Dr. Townsend Parchman was skeptical Damon would have lived more than a few minutes upon receiving the stab wounds to his back. And I also mentioned this in episode one. Did they ever do a recreation with dummies of that size to see if someone of Darley's stature and strength could have stabbed that hard as to go complete, almost completely through the body as the stab wounds were reportedly to have been basically completely through the body just about. So does a woman of her st small stature at the time, did she have the power, was she physically capable of doing what was done? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if this has been replicated. 
Prosecutor Greg Davis asked Dr. Townsend Parchment to give an estimate of the amount of time she believed Damon could have survived his injuries. She responded, minutes. She stated that if all four wounds were inflicted at the same time or within a very short period of time, he would have died within minutes. She testified that she could not tell exactly how long he would have lived, estimating on several occasions it would be just minutes. Defense attorney Mulder asked if it would be less than five minutes. She responded, likely. She went on to add that and that from the time he collapsed until the time he actually expired would probably be another few minutes. Mulder attempted to ask the doctor to give an exact time frame, asking her if there could be as much as eight or nine minutes. She testified, you can't tell. On redirect, Davis touched on the length of time Damon could have survived once again. Can you give us an estimate of how long this child might have lived if, say, stab wound one had been inflicted and then the other three were inflicted sometime later on? She responded, what we're talking about, a few to several more minutes. From the time Darley began the 911 call, so, so what's, the, what's, the, what's the theory here? She did one or two stabs, ran out to, to plant the sock, then came back and then finished the stabbing? Is that what the prosecution is going to shift to alleging? From the time Darley began the 911 call to the time the paramedics stated Damon took his last breath, about eight minutes had passed. Remember, Darley was not on the phone with 911 until after Darren came down the stairs and attended to Devon. It is important to factor the length of time it would have taken for Darren to wake up upon hearing a noise and appear in the family room when estimating how much time Darley had to stage a crime scene. According to Janice Townsend Parchment, Darley had approximately 0 to 60 seconds to stage the scene and injure herself. If the maximum amount of time Damon was likely to live is 9 minutes, the amount of time spent on the 911 call must be subtracted. Additionally, the nearly 2 minutes it took for the paramedics to enter the routine home must be subtracted. Finally, the paramedic testified that Damon was still alive during the two-minute period he provided to aid the child inside the home. The paramedics arrived on the scene five minutes after the call to 911 was made. They waited almost two minutes for the scene to be secured. Damon was still alive Damon was still alive during the two-minute time frame the paramedic attended to him. This adds up between eight or nine minutes, depending on the exact moment Damon died in the paramedic's care. Okay, so is there another theory here where... Would Darren have had to have been involved in order for the timeline to work if we're saying Darley committed this act or was involved in the committing of the act, possibly with Darren? Because then maybe they have the extra time to stage if one of them is also running to plant the sock. But that's not what the prosecution alleged, is it? Back to the article here. Now you have to ask yourself, did Darley really have time to do everything the prosecution claimed she did before she made that call to 911? As previously mentioned, a sock with Devin and Damon's blood was found several houses away. And I also postulated this on episode one. If they planted the sock, let's say the day before, theoretically that could work also because there was a very, very small amount of blood. It could have been from anything. It was on the ground near a trash can. There was no blood trail near the sock. If Darley placed it there as the prosecution contended she had to have done it after the boys were fatally injured and before she slashed her own neck not necessarily unless it was the day before possibly she would have had to have done it in bare feet or else she would have to take even more time upon arriving back at home to remove her shoes if barefoot she would have taken even longer to deposit the sock which was of course almost a whole football field away already we are looking at about a minute of time but we still have not factored in darley's injuries how much time would it have taken to injure herself to break the class to make it appear as though it had been knocked out of the wine rack by an intruder why not wait until she is absolutely certain both boys are dead before screaming to get darren's attention damon was alive when police arrived and when the paramedics attended to him if she stabbed her children why did she leave an obviously surviving witness the fact is, Darley did not have the amount of time to do everything the prosecution said she did. It simply doesn't make sense. One only needs to look at the 911 call and various testimony to figure that out. Unfortunately, it takes a lot of painstaking work to break the timeline down as I have above. Had the jury been able to do that, I have to seriously doubt they would have been able to convict Darley. Yeah, I mean, these are very, very good points in the timeline. As in every case, the timeline is critical. Because if we don't know what happened when, I mean, everything kind of goes out the window in terms of beyond a reasonable doubt. Because is this beyond a reasonable doubt or is there a reasonable doubt? This is clearly enough for some kind of doubt. That doesn't mean Darley's innocent. That doesn't mean she may not, possibly may not have done this with Darren's help. Because if her and Darren both did it, then the timeline could work. Again, that's not why I'm alleging. This is my check. I'm not alleging anything is true or untrue. But if you're going to say she's guilty... 
it seems that it could not have played out the way the prosecution stated, in which case it is still a wrongful conviction, even if she's guilty. And that's without even getting into all of these other oddities, which produce even more doubt. So let's look at the fingerprints here. Also from uh, Justice for Juveniles, August 17, 2012, doubt in the Darley Routier case, the fingerprints. I said in a previous blog that I would write about the Darley Routier case again. The truth is I could write an entire book on this particular case and still not cover everything. Indeed, several people have already written books on the case, and I feel comfortable saying there is still more to this complex story than most people realize. There are many who believe that the state of Texas got it right when they prosecuted Darley for the death of one of her two young boys, Damon. You know what else is weird is the reason they didn't prosecute her for the other boy simply because they thought Darren was also involved, but they couldn't prove it for whatever reason, and they just wanted to go after her instead of Darren? I mean, I don't know. Again, here, just speculating. In the first episode, I originally speculated that they wanted a second shot at convicting her, which is why they only tried her for one. But, however, the evidence has slowly emerged over the years that cast doubt on the theory presented by the prosecution at trial. Assistant DA Greg Davis was adamant that the crime scene inside the Routier home was staged and that the sole person responsible for the murders of Devin and Damon was none other than their own mother. Many people believed this theory when it was presented. They believed it in spite of the injuries Darley sustained. Though a number of people testified that Darley's injuries were superficial, doctors who treated her at Baylor University Medical Center stated under oath that during exploratory surgery of her neck wound, it was determined that the knife had sliced within two millimeters of her corroded artery. Had the artery been severed, Darley would have died within, without immediate treatment within minutes. So actually, you know what? Someone actually commented, uh, I don't remember who it was. I don't know if it was either in the uh, chat on the live or it was uh, in the comment section in ep during episode one. So I postulated that she, theoretically, if she's guilty, she could have attempted to commit suicide and failed. But it's difficult to believe she would have intentionally uh, sliced near her corroded artery, obviously, if she was looking to survive and just stage this attack. Someone commented, if she's really, really dumb, does she not know what the corroded artery is? And was she just slicing her neck just to make it look like an attack and did not intend to kill herself? I hadn't gone over that in episode one, so that's an interesting theory as well. Do, do, is it possible she was that dumb she would carelessly slice next to her corroded artery not knowing what it was? Again, this is my check. We got to go down every single rabbit hole. Obviously, it doesn't explain all these other things, but I did want to touch upon that because, again, we are comprehensive here. Continuing on here, there is evidence to suggest someone outside of the Routier family entered it during the early morning hours of June 6, 96, before police responded to Darley's 911 call. I'll begin with a discussion of the fingerprint evidence. A single bloody fingerprint, sometimes referred to as a fingerprint or a partial palm print, though it looks like a fingerprint, was left on the glass table in the Routier's family room the morning of the murders. At trial, Dallas police officer James Cron testified that there was not enough detail to make an identification. He suggested the print was left by one of the two young boys. The investigators working on the case failed to obtain the fingerprints of Devin and Damon to use for comparison purposes. What? What? Why? Additionally, neither of the two medical examiners who conducted autopsies on the boys took their prints. In an attempt to put an end to speculation that the bloody fingerprint from the glass table belonged to one of the boys, the children were exhumed. Measurements of the children's fingers were taken. The children were buried together holding hands. This combined with the passage of time and conditions within the coffin compromised the ability to collect the boy's prints. However, some fingerprints were obtained along with the measurements. Richard Jantz conducted an analysis of the print taken from the glass table. Jantz obtained his PhD in anthropology from the University of Kansas. In 2002, Jantz signed an affidavit pertaining to his examination of the bloody print that had become known as Exhibit 85J. He explained in the report that the purpose of the examination was to address the question of whether the fingerprint was made by an adult or child. For the examination, Jantz compared the dimension of the fingerprints from a collection of dermatoglyphic prints for adults and children. Children's prints made between the ages of 4 and 6.6 .6 years were analyzed for the study. Jantz also had the fingerprint cards for the Routier children for consideration. The fingerprint was made in blood consisted of a whorl pattern. Jantz determined that Devin had a whorl panel pattern on one of his right fingers. 
Damon had a whorl pattern on his right thumb. When Jantz compared the dimensions of the latent fingerprint against Damon's thumb and Devin's finger, he determined that the value from the core to flexion crease was almost two millimeters less than the fingerprint obtained from the Routier home for Devin, and over three millimeters less for Damon. To break this down in simpler terms, Jantz provided a chart that contained the average measurements for individuals falling within specific classifications. Again, these were based on the collection of fingerprints I referred to above. The males in the sample had an average measurement of 14.285 from core to flexion crease. Females had an average of 12.306. Children between the ages of 4 and 6.6 .6 years had an average of 9.21. The bloody fingerprint measured 12.6. So Darley Routier is clearly a average to below average female in size and stature. She's not a large female. And this print is measuring larger than average. Now, I'm assuming they measured Darley's. I mean, let's see what else is here. Because some people think that the fingerprint is Darley's. And there's obviously a lot of speculation about that. But the fingerprint is measuring 12.6, so larger than an average female. Based on the data provided by Jantz, the latent print was not consistent with a young child. It appeared to be the most consistent with an adult female. However, it is important to note that a variation in measurements exists. Standard deviation for the male measurements was 1.881. Well, what's the standard for the female, though? Because if the standard is about one, then that, yes, could still fall within uh, within that deviation. Jantz also looked at the ridge breadth, which represents ridges that run transversely across the finger between the pattern and the flexion crease. Jantz also wrote, it is obvious that the latent print has coarser ridges than either Damon's thumb or Devin's digit. Those two digits were compared since they were the only ones containing whorl patterns. The average measurement in centimeters for adult males was 18.446 with a standard deviation of 2.231. For women, the measurement was an average 20.386 with a standard deviation of 2.085. Finally, the children average measurement was 27.322 with a standard deviation of 3.077. The latent print measured 20.6. So it is a female? Jantz concluded by saying the foregoing analysis is able to successfully identify the prints of the two known children, the thumb of Damon Routier, the digit from Devon Routier as those of children. The latent print consistently has a higher probability of having been made by an adult. The probabilities range from 0.767 to 0.985, depending upon which character is used. Though Jantz report supports the defense's contention that the print did not belong to either of the Routier children, it is not sufficient on its own to exclude Darley Routier as the source of the print. The logical progression of thinking on the part of the state and those convinced of Darley's guilt was that the print belonged to Darley. So they changed their story. So it's no longer the boys, now it's Darley. In 2003, Robert Lone signed an affidavit wherein he described comparing Darley Routier's fingerprints to the Latin bloody print obtained from the glass table. Previously, Lons worked as a latent print examiner from 79 to 96. He worked in conjunction with the New York City Major Case Squad and the Federal Bureau of Investigation Joint Bank Robbery Task Force. He taught homicide investigation courses and conducted training seminars on detection and recovery methods for latent prints. Lons compared the latent print to a print card containing Darley's fingerprints. After conducting analysis of the prints, Lons concluded that, quote, number 85J was not made by the person from whom the fingerprints on Exhibit B were taken, end quote. Exhibit B consisted of Darley Routier's fingerprints. Lons was not contacted by the state or Darley's defense to make the comparison either. He was contacted by ABC News. Okay, that's kind of weird. So did Darley's defense, were they afraid that it really was her print? So they didn't want to take the chance of finding out and they just leave it ambiguous? And obviously the prosecution didn't, I mean, why didn't they want to do it? Because they already had Darley pegged. So ABC News, a somewhat neutral party in this whole saga, since they aren't technically on the side of the prosecution or the defense in this particular case, or at least not yet, possibly. I mean, again, depending on how you view the uh, showing of the cemetery tape, whatever. So they contacted this uh, lead expert, this FBI experienced guy, this uh, guy who taught homicide investigation courses with decades of, of 
experience as a latent print examiner. So he unequivocally concluded, quote, number 85J was not made by the person from whom the fingerprints on Exhibit B were taken, end quote. And Exhibit B is Darlie Routier's fingerprints, and you can uh, verify this in the court documents. So, okay. The prosecution responded by submitting the affidavit of Pat Wertheim, who concluded that all of Darley's fingerprints were excluded except the ring finger of her right hand. Wertheim claimed that the finger could not be matched to the latent print nor excluded. One of the attorneys, Stephen Cooper, handling Darley's appeals, told the media, no less than three other fingerprint experts have concluded Darley as a possible source. Whoa, that is so disingenuous. Possible? I mean, theoretically, anything's possible, but it, if, it doesn't match, so... That's kind of weird. Cooper stated that Jance was not included in the three experts who concluded the convicted woman as a source of the print, of course. So the most expert guy, his opinion was not included. Darley's attorneys also claimed in her writ of habeas corpus that the above described fingerprint has been compared to law enforcement personnel who responded to the scene. The state changed their story to fit the crime and to fit evolving explanation of evidence based on advancements in expertise and science. The prosecution originally suggested the fingerprint was left by a child. When this claim was challenged, the prosecution altered their story by claiming Darley was the contributor of the print. It appears the state has been unable to obtain a statement that definitively identifies Darley as a source of print. The best they have is to offer is the contention that a single finger on Darley's right hand cannot be excluded or identified as the contributor. But what does that even mean? Does that finding have any value in light of other experts finding the print does not match Darley? In terms of fingerprint evidence, there appears to be more. In 2003, Darley's attorneys filed a renewed motion for the testing of physical and biological evidence, combined with a request for an evidentiary hearing. Two fingerprints were taken from the utility room door leading to the garage of the Routier home. One print was made in blood and the other was not. The fingerprint below the bloody print was examined by Lons and identified as matching the middle finger of Darren's left hand. However, the motion states that two experts, Lons and a forensic fingerprint analyst named Glenn Langenberg, examined the same print to determine if Darley could be identified or excluded as the source of the print. Both experts excluded her. The experts did not agree as to whether or not Darren was the source of the print. However, Langenberg's assessment deferred from Lons in that it excluded Darren as the contributor. In 2008, the federal court granted Darley's request to test evidence in part. Regarding the fingerprint evidence, the motion stated the following, quote, The bloody fingerprint deserves to be examined with the most modern techniques available. The same is true for the fingerprints marked as state exhibit numbers 85-F and 85-G. The bloody print refers to the first piece of evidence discussed above, which consisted of a fingerprint located on the glass table. However, this has been put on hold until Texas is finished with other approved testing. In another motion filed in 2008, Darley's defense asked that the court grant the request to run the fingerprint evidence through all available fingerprint databases. The defense added, as with DNA testing, any identification of this print as belonging to a male outside of the Routier family will provide powerful corroboration of Miss Routier's account. Indeed, it would. It would destroy the prosecution's theory that there was not an intruder, as Darley claimed. If any of the prints are run through a fingerprint database and match someone outside the Routier home who was in the area at the time, it would mean an intruder did enter the family home. If there is a match to either of the bloody fingerprints to someone outside the immediate family, it means that they were present during the attacks because the prints were made in blood. I mean, is that really true, though? Like, what, did the paramedic not touch the table? Is it possible the paramedic, or one of the paramedics, no, but they tested their prints, too, and it didn't match. Okay. I placed a photograph of the print made in blood left on the glass table on Exhibit B, the fingerprint card used to compare Dolly Routier's prints to those found in the home. Click on the picture to see the larger version. In addition to possibly matching one or more prints to someone outside the Routier home, there is also the chance that DNA tests may be successful in extrapolating DNA belonging to a non-family member. DNA tests are, I mean, that's a good point too. So it's not just about the print because if they get the DNA, if they get the blood and it's not anybody else's blood, who does the blood belong to? So who did they, so they did not match the blood to anybody? So they're saying it's Darley's print, but not Darley's blood? Like what's going on here with this print? 
DNA tests are currently far more sophisticated than they were in 96 and 97 when the crimes originally occurred and when Darley was tried in the death of Damon. DNA testing and retesting was approved for a number of items. In April 2012, the court ordered the materials to be delivered to the Department of Public Safety Laboratory no later than the 23rd of May. The court ordered that the testing take place in a timely and efficient manner. It is now mid-August 2012. Some may deny there is any doubt at all in this case, but I feel that people who take the time to review all the available evidence will find it difficult to conclude that there is not reasonable doubt. Others who read through the evidence, particularly those who have witnessed the aftermath of wrongful convictions, some of which have been corrected, are likely to come to the realization that justice was not served in this case. Two little boys died horrific deaths and their mother is on death row for the crime. Texas has executed people in situations where there was considerable doubt about their actual guilt. Johnny Garrett is merely one example. Texas has even gone to great lengths to keep the truth from surfacing. In Garrett's case, the state threatened to take legal action against the family if they pursued DNA testing to prove his innocence after his execution had already taken place. That particular case is chronicled in a documentary called The Last Word. Though low budget, the film is a cautionary tale about the rush to justice that occurs in some situations, resulting in the delay or denial of justice. There is much more evidence and information worth examining in this case. I have decided that the best thing to do is to break this down into smaller descriptions over time. The most salient question that remains in this case is this. Should any state carry out an execution where there is serious doubt as to whether or not the person committed the crime? More importantly, now that you know there is doubt, are you comfortably standing by and merely hoping that the wheels of justice eventually move in the right direction? I'm not. I hope there are many more who feel as I do. Okay. Yeah, I mean, a lot of issues there. One final post. Actually, there's a couple more posts here. Doubt in the Darley Routier case, strange occurrences. So let's get into Mineshack land. August 18, 2012. It has been said that the prosecution's case against the Texas mother of three, Darley Lynn Routier, was circumstantial. Darley is now on death row as a result of her 97 conviction in connection with the death of her youngest son, Damon. I previously wrote about the fingerprint evidence in Darley's case, but I wanted to switch gears a little and discuss some of the strange occurrences surrounding the murders of the Dar Routier children. Uncovering the truth about what happened during the early morning hours of June 6, 96 requires one to look at reported occurrences and sightings before, during, and after the crimes took place. Examination of this type of case must extend outside of the family home and reflect an overall picture of the neighborhood as well. Below is a synopsis of some of the events and sightings that reportedly took place. The attempted break-in. On June 11th of 96, Mary Angela Rickles, known as Angel... Angel Leo Rickles, known as Angel, contacted the Rowlett Police Department to inform them that... During the early morning hours of June 6th, an unidentified man attempted to enter her home. The defense called Rickles to testify at Darley's trial. She explained that she had been home with her 15-year-old daughter when the incident happened. She was married and also had two other children who were staying with their grandmother at the time. Her husband worked the night shift, leaving the house at 9.30 p.m. and returning the following morning at 9.30 or 10 a.m. Rickles testified that she was watching television at 1.30 a.m. when a series of strange occurrences took place. At first, she heard sounds as though someone were trying to get in the house through a door. Initially, she believed it was her husband who would come home from work periodically to check on her. She had suffered a stroke, a number of heart attacks, and had also recently lost her brother. However, she became suspicious when she heard the sound of wood splitting and a loud cracking noise. This prompted her to turn on her porch light to see what was happening. In her testimony, she described seeing two men standing outside through a peephole in the door. One was stockier than the other, wearing a knit cap. He had blonde hair sticking out from under the cap. She said he was wearing a dark jogging suit. The other individual was tall and thin. The men ran from the house and headed in the direction of Willowbrook Drive. Willowbrook eventually leads to Eagle Drive, where the Routiers live. Wait, what is going on here? So there's some kind of a noise. She looks through the peephole. There's two guys standing around. Then they just randomly ran from the house. So they tried to get in, couldn't get in. She saw them through the peephole, and then they run away. That's kind of weird. Okay. Once the men left, Rickles described feeling as though the incident had passed, but she was still frightened. Rickles explained during her testimony that she proceeded to calm her 15-year-old daughter who had also witnessed the events and was scared. They resumed watching television and a short time later heard what sounded like tapping coming from the bedroom 
window located near the front of the house. Now, this is really creepy. Rickles peered through the blinds and saw that the two men had returned. This time, she saw they had a metal object that looked like either a screwdriver or a knife. She turned off the bedroom light and the men left. They did not return again that evening. What is going on here? So as soon as the light gets turned off, they leave? That's kind of weird. Wouldn't, they, wouldn't that embolden them because they think they're going to sleep? Though shaken by the incident, Rickles testified that she did not call the police that, asked not, that night to report the incident. She stayed awake the rest of the night. Later on that morning, she told her husband she would go on to relay the story to other family members. Rickles did not call the police until the 11th. She explained that once the incident took place, she did not see a point in calling them. She said the following during trial, Well, at the time, I was thinking it's all over. What can the police, what can they do now, you know? Wow, sounds like a smart lady. <laughs> How often do police actually catch burglars, let alone burglars who were simply attempting a burglar and not actually uh, following through on it? And also keep in mind, I mean, supposedly this is a woman who had suffered multiple heart attacks and a stroke. So just keep that in mind. And she's still sharp enough to uh, <laughs> understand the percentage of clearance on police cases. She also reported seeing a dark vehicle parked outside. She did not recognize the vehicle, but it appeared to remain in the same spot throughout the night. She did not describe seeing anyone getting into or out of the vehicle that night, just that the car was present during the same time frame. A telephone memorandum taken by the Rowlett police stated the vehicle in question belonged to someone living on Miami Drive. Okay, so maybe not connected to these guys. You would think if they were these two guys, they wouldn't have left their car parked there, left, and then come... I mean, who knows, but... The bizarre incidents did not stop with the attempted break-in, however. In August, Rickles saw what appeared to be the same vehicle as the one she saw the morning of June 6th. She stated, well, again in August, I saw that car pull out there, and what triggered my memory was that the person that got out of the car was the same build as the stocky guy that I had seen before, and so I ran in and called the police. The police came to the home, and Rickles described them coming to the home. She pointed out to them and bringing out a small, skinny person in handcuffs. She said the person they removed from the home was shorter than the one she saw on June 6th. Wait a second. She pointed out to them? What? So the police actually arrested some guy just because she pointed him out? A small, skinny person? There seems to be more to this story here. The po are the police really going to just arrest a guy? She said that this guy is shorter than the guy. So she saw a, the stocky guy is the one she identified. So she called the police. The police came and arrested some guy that is not the stocky guy that she pointed out. What is going on here? In November, Rickles stated that she had gone out to her garage to smoke a cigarette at about 2.30 to 3 a.m. The garage door was open about a foot. She heard what sounded like shuffling footsteps in the driveway. She then testified to the following, quote, I was just scared, and so I just pulled the door down and stuck a stick in the door so they couldn't lift it. She called the police again later on that morning. Wait, 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 what happened? Wait, 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 what happened? Where's the rest of this story? She locked the person in the dry... Wait, what? Oh, wait a second. Shuffling... So they already went... They already... Did they already run away? And she stuck the door... The, stuck a stick in the door so that they couldn't lift it from the outside ever again. So it's not that she locked them in there. No further information was given during the testimony about the attempted break in the car sighting or even the police removing an individual in handcuffs from a nearby home. All of this just disappeared. Like, why can I not find any actual information about this? Because if this is other criminals not related to the Routier case, I mean, you would think that having some information, oh yeah, this guy was arrested in connection with this other case. Here's all the information. But it just randomly completely disappeared. That's kind of weird. The report of the break-in coincides with the time frame in which Darlie Routier claimed an unknown person entered her home. So coincidentally, the night of the murders is the only other time there was a, an attempted burglary reported in the neighborhood. Is that true? I mean, we'll see here. Let's see if, let's see what else is reported here. Rickles described the first incident occurring at 1.30 a.m. The men left the area and returned at approximately 2 a.m. It was after, t I mean, what, what is going on here? 
These two guys try to get in. They can't get in. They leave. A half hour later, they return with either a screwdriver or a knife. But as soon as she turns off the light in her bedroom, they leave again. <sighs> what? The men left the area and returned at approximately 2 a.m. It was after 2 a.m. that Rickles described seeing the vehicle. So the vehicle was, she did not notice the vehicle the first time the men came. So is it possible the vehicle is not associated with the men? Uh, well, maybe not, because on a different day, she saw what looked to be the stockier man exit the vehicle. These times are estimates, but they occurred before Darley made a 911 call reporting the stabbing of her two children and the attack on herself. That call took place at 2.30 a.m. This is a really weird timeline. So is it mere coincidence that at 1.30 and 2 a.m. there are these two guys trying to get into a home and then Darley calls at 2.30 a.m.? It is important to point out that the Rickles family home was about a half a mile from the Routier home. It would take approximately nine minutes to walk from the home on Miami Drive to where the Routier family lived on Eagle Drive. In Rowlett, Texas, it would take far less time to drive. The police noted on the telephone memorandum that the vehicle was a 1989 Ford two-door. The make of the car was not given, even though the police provided other details such as a license plate number. So they do have a plate number. Huh. Very, very interesting. Reported vehicle and people sightings. In the time leading up to the crimes, a number of unusual sightings were reported. June 6th, Sally Bingham reported to police that she was a neighbor of the Routier family. She described being awake at 1 to 1.30 a.m. the morning the murders took place. Bingham stated that she kept seeing car lights driving through the neighborhood. Her bedroom had a bay window. The vehicle made several trips down the street before Bingham finally got up and looked outside to see a white vehicle. The only other description of the vehicle was celebrity type. All right, so what, what does that mean? So... Are we to presume this is not a normal occurrence, that this celebrity-type white vehicle is just randomly driving through the neighborhood back and forth between 1 and 1.30 a.m.? Is that the only time she ever remembers that happening? I mean, we don't have that information here, but... June 7th, Betty Jung reported that her son saw a suspicious-looking man in the morning wearing jeans, a white shirt, and a black cap. He was also carrying a knapsack. A note on the memo states, pro quote, probably the same person Officer Kaylet questioned on 66 at Barrett's, end quote. The sighting took place at the Rowlett Vet Clinic, located three miles west of the Routier home. An additional lead sheet described a man fitting the same description carrying a backpack near I-30 and Dal Rock. The tip was dated June 6, 1996, 4 p.m. It described the sighting as taking place at 5 a.m. I-30 was located south of the Routier home, about two and a half miles away. Was the person observed in these two separate sightings the same individual? Who did Kaylet question? And apparently there's no further information on this, which is, which is a little bit curious. Also, on June 7th, Jonathan Hartley called police to report that the Dallas Morning News mail carrier had threatened him. He also stated the man's name was Ray Clemens and suggested the police look into him. Hartley lived on Eagle Drive, approximately 285 feet from the Routier home. Okay, has this ever happened in a, in a murder case before? The following day, somebody reports the mail carrier as threatening them the day after a murder occurred, right in the immediate vicinity, within a few hundred feet. Corey Keith lived in the neighborhood and contacted police on June 7th to report an incident that occurred during the week before the murders. He described returning home at 2.30 to 3 a.m. I mean, this is a neighborhood with a lot of late night, early morning activity here and seeing an older-style minivan driving slowly down Eagle Drive. He described the occupants of the van as, quote, shining lights on houses, end quote. The van left the area as Keith approached. He tried to turn around to get a better look at the van, but was unable to locate it once he did. The only other description of the van was that it was possibly light tan in color. The driver appeared to be a white male in his 20s. No description was given for the passenger. 
Julie Clark was another person who contacted the police the day after the murders. She described herself as a close friend of the Routiers, and when she testified at Darley's trial, she indicated that on the day of the murders, a woman who cleaned Darley's house saw a black vehicle. So we have multiple different sightings here of a black vehicle, one sighting of a white vehicle, and one sighting of a van. The sighting of the black car was reported by the woman's daughter, Barbara Jovell, as well. Jovell's mother reportedly saw a black two-door sports car driving slowly down the alley located behind the Routier home. So not just in the neighborhood, but directly in the alley where the sock was found? The vehicle stopped in the alley and was described as having a dark complexion. When Jovell's mom went into the garage, the vehicle was driven away. Barbara also reported seeing a vehicle matching the same description. On June 5th, Barbara had gone to pick up her mother from Darley's home. As the two were leaving, they saw a black sports car pass them. Barbara's mom said it was the same vehicle she saw the day before. Barbara added to the description by stating the car had bad paint and a short trunk area. So this wasn't a particularly well-maintained vehicle. On June 8th, John Reed contacted police to report that the day of the murders he was in the front yard cleaning up. His two grandchildren were there with him, and they saw a white male sitting in a faded blue older model four-door car. He described the man as suspicious. The distance from the address indicated on the telephone memo and the routier home is 0.4 miles. No further information is provided on the telephone lead sheet. However, the words duplication of one Keith had is written across the bottom. At the top of the page, it says same, and then shows number 0021 over the number 0007. Wait, what? Does that mean other people also had this sighting of this vehicle? A separate lead sheet with the same date gave a little bit more information. The tip describes the man seeing a car parked down the street. The driver appeared to be watching the man's grandchildren. So this is, this is June 8th, so this... Okay, but this incident occurred the day of the murder. So it was reported June 8th. So, but this was the day of the murders. There's a guy looking, creepy guys looking at children. What does everybody make of this? Because supposedly this is not a normal occurrence, at least not in this neighborhood. Otherwise, there'd be way more reports, right? The lead sheet says that when the man who reported this got into the vehicle to drive down to the suspicious looking car, the man pulled away and left. So apparently, I guess this man is not a known neighbor. The address matched the one above, but the last name was recorded as something other than Reed. Additionally, under the street address at Highgate Lane, the officer wrote Dallas, Texas. The street address exists in both Dallas and Rowlett. If the police obtained information of the correct city, it is not indicated. The address in Dallas is almost 20 miles from the Routier home. So they can't even clarify this? What is going on here? And this is this all confusion and obfuscation by design? That's the question here. On June 9th, Bill Nuth contacted police and gave them information about seeing a vehicle cruising the neighborhood the evening of the murders. Knuth said the driver was a young white male who was acting suspiciously. The car apparently stopped near the Routier's corner house around 7 to 8 p.m. He was unable to get a plate number, saying only that the vehicle observed was either a Geostorm or a Dodge Neon. The vehicle had two doors, a hatchback, and was either blue or purple. Man, this is a lot of suspicious cars being reported. On June 17th, Officer Needham described a report police received of a black Nissan with an identified Texas plate that was observed in the area of the Routier home. Officer Needham and Detective Latham also saw this vehicle. Wow, so the cops saw it? The lead sheet reads, quote, owner had been sitting in the area after the murders, sightseeing, end quote. No further information was given about the owner of the car or whether police established the individual had an alibi the night of the murders. Wait, what? So described a police report observed in the area of the Routier home. So. What's the date here, though? So this, the report was made on the June 17th. Huh. So they said he was sightseeing. 
Hmm. Yeah, it would be curious to know if this vehicle matched the previous vehicle sighted before the murders. Perhaps one of the stranger vehicle sightings was reported by Bob Salzi. He first called into the police department on June 8th. He was a delivery person for the Daily Business News and delivered the paper across the street from the Routier home at 12.30 a.m. the night of the murders. In the first description, it says, did not see anything suspicious. The following day, Detective Needham spoke to Salzi. He reiterated that he was in the area the evening of the murders, 12 to 12.30 a.m. However, this time he said he saw a white car in the driveway of the Routier home. It was described as suburban type. Okay, so now there, so there's two white cars reported, several different or possibly the same black cars and a tan, possible tan van and a possible purple or blue vehicle. Although if it's reflecting something at night, is it possible they mistook the blue or purple for black? The Routiers had two vehicles in June of 96. The first was a dark green Nissan Pathfinder. The second was an older Jaguar, but the Jaguar was in the shop at the time of the murder, so it was not present. Okay, very interesting. It appears the police may have dismissed the sightings because the note says that Salzi was colorblind. The problem is that a person who is colorblind is unlikely to mistake a dark green vehicle for a white one. There are different forms of colorblindness. A person who has it may have difficulty identifying red, green, or both. However, people who are colorblind can see different shades in that their inability to distinguish a color does not mean it would appear blank or white. Another problem with dismissing the sighting of a vehicle in the driveway that night is that the Pathfinder was not parked in the driveway of the Routier home. Okay, wow, this is damning then. Various testimony throughout Darley's trial revealed that the Pathfinder was routinely parked out in front of the house, not in the driveway. A neighbor named William Gorsuch testified that he saw the vehicle parked in front of the home the morning of the murders. Darren also testified he parked the Pathfinder in front of the home. Why don't they park in the driveway though? Is that they just don't want to? So we have evidence, multiple neighbors all say they don't park in the driveway. Whose car was parked in the driveway the evening, that evening if it was not the Routiers? Okay, this is weird. So we have a mysterious black vehicle cited by multiple people, and then also um, two people citing this mysterious white vehicle also possibly parked in the driveway. This is crazy. This is truly mind-shocking. Why is nobody talking about this? In 2002, Darlene Potter gave an affidavit describing an unusual sighting during the early morning hours of June 6. Potter was returning to her residence after visiting her daughter in Cleburne, Texas. Sometime after 2 a.m., she reported that she had reached Dalrock Road north of Highway 66. Wow, this is crazy. June 6, 96, next to Highway 66? This is a little too weird for some people. And also, the uh, the Routier home is right next to the cemetery as well. The cemetery uh, is very, very close behind it. As she approached the curve, she slowed down considerably because she was pulling a trailer behind her van. She stated the following, quote, I suddenly saw a man walking on the edge of the left side of the roadway headed in the same direction I was going. He was about six feet tall, medium build, had shoulder-length brownish hair, which was messed up, wearing a black t-shirt. He was barefooted, end quote. Potter then observed a second man walking on the left edge of the road as well. She described the second man as wearing a light-colored baseball cap, a white shirt, and blue jeans. She said he was tall and stocky, standing at about 5'8". In reference to the second man, Potter added, quote, as I approached this man, he stepped from the side of the road as if he were walking toward my vehicle. I was just starting to accelerate slowly from out of the curve at this time. And when I saw the man stepping towards my car, he looked in the direction of the first man. I then looked in my mirror again and saw the first man shaking his head as if to say no to the second man. How creepy is this? I mean, this is not that far from the route to your home. I actually didn't even see this before. This is insane. On the map, there's a triangle here. Basically forming Lakeview Parkway is Route 66. Highway, or Highway 66. This is June 6th, 1996. And in between the route to your home and Highway 66 is a cemetery. 
What does everybody make of this? It's a little weird, even for Mind Shock, even for me. This this is quite a big stack of sixes here. Very very creepy stuff here. I don't know what to make. I don't know what to make of this. This is just so weird. Sixty six is right there. Highway sixty six, June sixth, nineteen ninety six. This is just weird, and right and right next to a cemetery. Okay, so what were these men doing? And do these men match the description of the other person who said that they were trying to break into her house? The sighting stood out in her mind. And, and why is all this weird stuff going on the night of the murders? So all of this is going on June 6th. <laughs> I mean, this is just weird. In reference to the second man in the wee hours of the, of the morning. I mean, this is crazy. The sighting stood out in her mind because one of the men was barefooted and also because it occurred so early in the morning. It made her uneasy because she lived in the area. She returned home and tried to sleep. About 45 minutes later, she said she observed a small dark colored car driving through the field next door to her home. She said it appeared as if it were riding its brakes. No address is given for Potter, so it is difficult to determine which field she was referring to or how far she lived from the routier home. But she clearly gave the the intersection for the sighting. And again, is this all by design? Like, none of her info is listed? Like, they don't want anybody to follow up from her? The sighting of the two men on foot happened approximately 0 0.6 miles from the Routier residence. Concluding remarks. The above descriptions pose more questions than they answer. These strange occurrences suggest that there was more going on in the neighborhood at the time of the murders than the police and the prosecutors were willing to acknowledge. Some of this information was presented in court, some was not. For example, there is discussion in the trial transcripts of the police receiving information that a dark colored vehicle was observed in the area. As previously disclosed, the defense also called Rickles to the stand to reiterate what she told police and others about an attempted break-in during the early morning hours of June 6th. However, it is difficult to find all the information pertaining to the people and events observed in the time frame surrounding the murders. For instance, police confirmed that canvassing was done in the neighborhood. This is where officers go door-to-door -to, -door to ask if anyone heard, saw, or experienced anything unusual before, during, or after the murders that might be connected. I have been unable to locate these notes. But if they exist, they are likely stored with the other police files relating to this case. There is much more to cover that creates doubt about the prosecution's case against Darley Routier. The more information revealed, the more apparent it becomes that an overzealous prosecution of a young mother may have resulted in a wrongful conviction. I mean, this seems to be a clear wrongful conviction, even if she's guilty, because there's just so many problems here. Now, regarding all of this bizarre activity, I, we need some controls here. Does the average night in the neighborhood also involve reports of break-ins, vehicles cruising the area, and barefoot men just randomly walking around? I mean, is this normal for this particular neighborhood? Because supposedly this is a relatively upscale neighborhood. I mean, what is going on here? And why June 6th, 1996, next to Highway 66? Let's look at some more information here from this blog. Doubt in the Darley Routier case, the subjective science. September 2nd, 2012. The prosecution's case against Darley Routier presented in court in 97 was based on circumstantial evidence. Lacking true and convincing physical evidence directly linking Darley to the murders of her two sons as well as the attack inflicted on herself, the prosecution focused on an approach to crime scene analysis that the National Academy of Scientists has stated is, quote, more subjective than scientific, end quote. And there actually is a link here to the National Academy's the National Academy of Sciences, Strengthening the Forensic Science in the U.S., A Path Forward, published 2009, right on the National Academy's website, nap.nationalacademies.org. Wow. So this is an official source here. Sciences, engineering, and medicine source here. Wow. That is interesting. I mean, there's a lot of, there were a lot of people commenting on episode one on how this was just a slam dunk, easy case, no reason to go into it. But yet we have here the National Academy of Sciences stating that the crime scene analysis here was, quote, more subjective than scientific, end quote. So how is anybody to hallucinate that this was proven beyond a reasonable doubt. 
when it's all subjective, changing stories of police, non-followed up leads. I mean, there is so much shady business here that even if she's guilty, this is a clear wrongful conviction. So that approach is known as bloodstain pattern analysis. In 2010, the Texas Observer pointed out that three confirmed wrongful convictions had resulted from flawed blood spatter analysis. This is, these are some well-researched articles here. Texas Observer, August 19, 2010, A Bloody Injustice by Dave Mann, referencing all of these cases here. Very easy to verify. This says nothing about how many wrong convic wrongful convictions have taken place as a result of subjective bloodstain pattern analysis that have not yet been confirmed or have not received the kind of attention that some cases do. That's an excellent point. A lot of goofs hallucinate that, tri that juries almost never get it wrong or never get it wrong and that the only wrongful convictions are the ones that people find out about. I mean, this is just weird goofery and hallucinations. I mean, it's just insane. I mean, obviously, it's an unknown quantity of innocent people in prison. Along with the above information, the Observer published a detailed account of the conviction of Warren Harnack. Harnack was a less than sympathetic individual who was indicted by a grand jury on suspicion he murdered his wife, Bonnie. He claimed his wife committed suicide in the family home March 14, 1995, after the two had become severely intoxicated during an earlier night out. An investigation into the alleged suicide resulted in a shared conclusion on the part of the police sergeant responsible for supervising the investigation, the medical examiner who performed the autopsy, the crime scene investigator, and the local DA. Harnack's wife committed suicide using firearm. Fort Worth DA Mike Parrish declined to bring charges against Hornack. He later told the media, I always thought it was a suicide, still do. Bonnie's parents did not accept their daughter had taken their own life. Despite a history of depression in the past, they did not believe she was distraught enough during the time period surrounding her death to do something that extreme. Moreover, Hornack has a history of both being obnoxious and sometimes violent when he had too much to drink. When the DA refused to bring charges against Hornack, Bonnie's parents hired a lawyer who found a way to pursue charges without the assistance of the DA. Texas law allows any individual to bring evidence in front of a grand jury to seek an indictment. It is a well-known fact that when a grand jury is presented with evidence, it is easy to get an indictment. This case was no exception. However, the DA continued to refuse to prosecute Harnack. He claimed he had an ethical duty to refrain from charging a person with a crime when he believed that person was innocent. As a result, the DA's office in Tarrant County assigned two attorneys working in private practice to fill in as special prosecutors. These attorneys had access to resources the DA's office would not otherwise have had. Everything was backwards at Harnack's trial. The people who ordinarily testify on behalf of the prosecution testified on behalf of Hornack's defense. This included, but was not limited, to the sergeant in charge of the investigation, the DA who refused to seek charges in the first place, and the crime scene investigator. It was a situation that should only exist within an episode of The Twilight Zone. For the majority of Hornack's trial, it appeared that he would be acquitted, even though the foreman of the jury would later reveal that an acquittal was imminent. That is, until Tom Bevel took the stand. Before Bevel ever testified at Darley Routier's trial, he testified at what may only be described as the bizarre trial of Warren Horneck. Though bloodstain pattern analysis has been used since the late 1800s, it was and still is rarely used as the primary evidence against a defendant. It is often used to strengthen a case that is already based on physical evidence, such as DNA or fingerprints. In 96, when Bevel took the stand to testify that Horneck murdered his wife and that this contention could be confirmed through bloodstain pattern analysis, the National Academy of Sciences was 13 years away from publishing a report that outlined the serious limitations of using this approach to crime scenes analysis. The jurors who listened to Bevel found his testimony credible and convincing. Bevel stated that the tiny bloodstains on the shirt Horneck was wearing on the evening of his wife's death could only have resulted from a high velocity occurrence. He claimed that the cause of the bloodstains was Horneck's use of a gun. He argued that Horneck's repeated attempts to administer CPR were not the cause. The jury subsequently changed their mind about Horneck's innocence and convicted him of murdering his wife. They did this based on Tom Bevel's testimony. The Observer wrote, quote, Most criminal justice experts believe that flawed forensic evidence, the overreaching expert witnesses, have sent thousands of Americans to prison for crimes that didn't commit, they didn't commit, end quote. I mean, how staggering and mind-shocking is this? 
They're claiming thousands. Now, even if it's not thousands, even if it's only hundreds, I mean, that's still insane. And the gullible goofs, the coincidence, there's the authority worshiping cultists who are too utterly clueless to understand that different experts might have different opinions and that expert testimony is not the same thing as hard physical evidence. I mean, these goofs that just get triggered at any notion that someone convicted could be innocent. I mean, it's just insane. You see them all over true crime podcasts, all over the place. The article went on to state that a number of commonly used scientists, sciences presented in U.S. courtrooms, including bloodstain pattern analysis and arson investigations, are really just, quote, junk sciences, end quote. Jim Varnon was one of the officers who responded to the scene. He believes that Harnack was wrongfully convicted and has put together extensive evidence countering the bloodstain pattern analysis presented by Bevel. He has since been fighting to prove Harnack's innocence ever since. Harnack has since tried to appeal his conviction. In late 2011, the Observer provided an update on his case, explaining that there were two hearings in 2011 that occurred in reference to his case. Three forensic experts testified that overwhelming evidence points to a suicide. Yeah, it's weird. You have just a mountain of evidence and countless experts testifying that he's innocent, and only one was required to convict him. However, despite this and the fact that Bevel has been involved in other suspected wrongful convictions, including one in which a convicted man was later exon exonerated, Hornick remains in prison, Texas. So not only is, is this based on Bevel, but it's based on a guy who's been involved in possibly many different wrongful convictions, at least one of which was a definitive exoneration. So clearly this guy's not trustworthy. There are similarities in the case of Warren Hornick and Darley Routier. Both cases were based on circumstantial evidence. Both prosecutors presented Tom Bevel's ex in quotations, expert testimony regarding bloodstain analysis. Both crime scenes contained evidence that supported the convicted person's version of the events. Claims that Bevel used a science that has substantial limitations to discredit. The very group that claims Tom Bevel as a charter member known as the Scientific Working Group on Bloodstain Pattern Analysis, W-S-W-G-S-T-A-I-N, quote, recognizes that the opinions of bloodstain pattern analysts may contain an element of subjectivity, end quote. So this is just openly admitted basically by all parties that it's subjective. So how, how is this beyond a reasonable doubt if it's subjective and different people can interpret it in different ways? I mean, this is not beyond a reasonable doubt by any stretch of the imagination. Continuing the article here, really question mark, in light of this information, one has to ask just how reliable a conviction is when the weight of the prosecution's case rests on this type of science, in quotation signs. One also has to wonder just how many people convicted based on this science are truly innocent. In the next article, I would describe the case in which Bevel's testimony helped to send a juvenile to prison for life without the possibility of parole. This same teenager grew into a man behind bars, but was exonerated based on advanced approach to DNA testing. I mean, unfortunately, I mean, there's no shortage of these cases, and we only even hear about the ones that are found out about. So, I mean, it's even scary to think about. Obviously, the gullible goofs, the coincidence theorists, the authority worshiping cultists that think there really aren't any innocent people in prison, and they hallucinate to know this for sure. Sure. I mean, they're just too mentally weak to fathom that this there might be more than one or two innocent people in prison. There might be hundreds or even thousands. And that's a scary thought because in their cult of authority worship, they're too mentally weak to consider that, you know, experts don't always get it right. The justice system doesn't always get it right. They don't want to live in that kind of world. So their mental weakness renders them unable to actually think logically or critically. Continuing here, September 9, 2012, Subjective Science, Part 2. Two years after providing testimony on behalf of the prosecution at Darley Routier's 97 trial, bloodstain pattern analyst Tom Bevel was involved in a case where the accused was arrested, convicted, denied multiple appeals, and then granted a retrial that resulted in his release from prison three decades after the original crime occurred. And again, if you go back to episode one in this Darley Routier case, I mean, there's there's a number of clueless goofs in the comment section hallucinating that because den that somehow denied appeals means that it was a slam dunk and there's nothing to talk about. I mean, these goofs just hallucinate that appeals would never be denied if there was legitimate evidence. I mean, tons of wrongful convictions eventually overturned. Uh, there were many, many denied appeals throughout the entire process. I mean, this is rocket science, but for whatever reason, these goofs just have a really hard time with basic logic and reason. 
The man's name is Tim Masters, and he was only 15 years old when 37-year-old Peggy Hetrick was murdered in Fort Collins, Colorado. In February 87, Peggy ended her shift at work at 9 p.m. at a local clothing store. She had acquired a temporary roommate, and she had given her the only key she had. Her roommate had gotten drunk and passed out, oblivious to Peggy's banging on the door. Upon realizing she was locked out of her residence, Peggy went to a couple of bars and then returned home to get her key from the roommate. She changed her clothes and then returned to one of the bars just before midnight. Peggy did not have a vehicle, and so she relied on walking or obtaining rides from others. At the time of Peggy's murder, she was seeing a man named Matt Zollner. On the evening in question, Peggy and Zollner had an argument when she spotted him at the Prime Minister pub with another woman. She became extremely upset and left. This was the last time anyone reported seeing Peggy alive before her partially nude body was discovered the following morning by a person riding a bike. She was found near a curb that led into a field with her breasts exposed, her jeans and panties pulled down to her knees, and the straps of her purse still twisted around her arm. She had been stabbed and mutilated. The investigation. At the time, Peggy was found in the field. 15-year-old Tim lived with his father in a trailer. The residence sat atop a hill that overlooked the field. During a routine canvassing of the surrounding area, Detective Linda Wheeler Holloway was informed by Tim's father that he had observed his son go toward the area where Peggy's body was found as he was walking to school that morning. The detective had Tim pulled out of class and learned that he indeed had seen the woman's body, but did not think it was a real person. He thought it resembled the dolls his school used to teach CPR courses. During Tim's bus ride to school, he told the detective he started to wonder if he had seen a body instead of a doll. And obviously that's very, very traumatic for a teenager or for anybody to see that. So many people would probably want to believe it's a doll and not a real body. The following day, two detectives showed up at Tim's home while he was in school. One of the detectives was Jim Broderick. They asked Tim's father to sign a consent to allow them to search the property. Believing that neither he nor his son had anything to hide, Clyde signed the form and allowed the detectives to conduct the search. The detectives found a number of knives in Tim's bedroom. The detectives also found notebooks containing stories and drawings that Broderick described in a report as dealing, quote, with death and dismemberment of body parts and other graphic portrayals of people being killed and the narratives that describe it, end quote. And you know what's weird, though? I mean, how many millions or hundreds of thousands of teenagers could you also find in their, that in their notebooks? Tim was a withdrawn teenager who used his narratives and drawings as a mean of escaping. He was small, shy, and struggling with school. I mean, pretty much, I mean, again, when I was in school, I mean, any horror fans, any fans of horror movies or, or just the horror genre in general, whether it was novels or comic books, they, they all had these drawings and stories of death and mutilation and destruction and, and what, 99.99999% of them weren't even involved in a single fight or a single unlawful incident of any kind, let alone murder. He was small, shy, and struggling with school. Although he was not violent, he enjoyed creating pictures that focused on themes such as monsters and war. He had an interest in the armed forces and liked to read about those kinds of topics. Ordinarily, a murder investigation begins with those closest to the victim and then spans outwards. This was not exactly what detectives did while investigating Peggy's murder. The police learned about her somewhat tumultuous relationship with Matt Zollner early on. Zollner told police that he had run into Peggy at the Prime Minister and offered her a ride home. He had been waiting for another woman at the time. He claimed to have offered Peggy a ride home, but when he returned from using the restroom, she was gone. Detectives were less concerned with Zollner and much more interested in Tim. They questioned him at length, insisting he committed the murder. See, this is why cops get such a bad name. I mean, when these scumbags bully teenagers, not to find the truth, but blaming them before any investigation is even done. I mean, just, yeah, this, I mean, this is just plain old, it, this, man, this is just plain old coercion, which of course, now back in the 90s, a lot of the gullible goof authority worshiping cultist bootleggers, they thought that coerced, con co co coerced confessions and, and wrongful confessions, they weren't a thing. They didn't think cops would ever bully teens or young adults or, or even middle-aged people, just badgering them for countless hours into confessing murders they never committed. They didn't think that was a thing. Now, obviously, it's coming out more and more that this is just done so much more than people thought. It's just unconscionable, of course. 
Kim repeatedly informed the detectives that he was not involved. His father had signed a form that allowed police to interrogate his son for nine hours. I mean, this is just insanity. See, this is why, I mean, regardless of what the parents want, I mean, minors should still always obviously have an attorney present for, for all uh, questioning. Because again, it's not that some people think it makes you look guilty when you lawyer up, but just the amount of corruption, incompetence, and just uh, unconscionable immorality that police engage in. I mean, getting a lawyer, that should just be step one, no matter what, because you never know what kind of cops you're dealing with. I mean, because if they're good cops, they won't care if you get a lawyer anyway, because they're after the truth and they're going to follow the law. Only corrupt or unlawful cops, criminal cops, they might care because they're trying to just close the case regardless of the truth. Tim adamantly maintained his innocence despite the use of a wide range of tactics used by the officers attempting to extract a confession. The police had no physical evidence linking Tim to Peggy's murder. They did not have a confession or even an eyewitness claiming he was involved. All the police had were the drawings and writings of a sullen teenager who was trying to find his place in what he probably perceived as an unwelcoming environment. A year after the murder, a large team of police officers participated in a stakeout of his residence. They even went so far as to follow him incessantly and plant a false story in the news suggesting an arrest of a suspect was imminent. The police left copies of the story in places where Tim was sure to see them. Man, Tim really needs to sue all these cops for harassment and all this. I mean, this is insane. Police in Fort Collins were unable to make a convincing case against Tim with the evidence they had. As a result, Tim went on to graduate from high school and join the Navy. As Tim attempted to go on with his life, one of the detectives originally involved with investigating Peggy's murder made the decision to reopen the case. Detective Wheeler Holloway zeroed in on Tim once again in 1992 based on supposed new evidence involving something Tim had told a friend at his high school. When questioned about it, Tim told the police that he got the information from a classmate who had been involved in the police effort to search the field. Tim's claims were verified. The detectives did not pursue charges as a result. However, by 95, Jim Broderick had been promoted to the position of supervisor. He was in charge of the Crimes Against Persons Unit at the local police department. He made the decision to refocus his efforts on the seemingly cold case involving Peggy Hetrick. Broderick still insisted Tim Masters committed the murder. One of the detectives on Broderick's squad, Troy Krenning, did not share his supervisor's belief that Tim committed the murder. Krenning felt that the elements of the murder appeared to be too well executed for a skinny and unsophisticated 15-year-old boy. Broderick eventually hired a forensic pathologist, Reed Melloy, at the rate of $300 per hour to analyze Tim's writings and drawings. Melloy eventually earned more than $42,000. The psychologist indicated that Tim had murdered Peggy Hetrick as a means of committing a displaced matricide, the murder of one's mother or mother figure. See, this is why a lot of people think that these most psychologists are just clueless quacks. Because, <laughs> I mean, they can make anything out of anything. I mean, this is just insane. So Broderick hired this forensic psychologist. Is this with taxpayer money that added up to $42,000? Or was this out of his own pocket? D.A. Terry Gilmore was not as confident about the strength of the alleged evidence against Tim. However, Broderick took special care to convince him and Assistant D.A. Jolene Blair that they were on the right path. On August 10th of 98, Tim was arrested for Peggy's murder. Tim had been living in California. Following an honorable discharge from the Navy, he lived an ordinary life working as an aircraft mechanic. Enter Tom Bevel. The DA did not have physical evidence to present at Tim's 99 trial. It wasn't that physical evidence did not exist in the case. It was that the physical evidence in the case did not match the accused. An important element of the case against Tim was convicting a jury that the murder happened in the general area where Peggy's body was found. After all, Tim had been a thin 15-year-old teenager when the murder occurred. The prosecution called Tom Bevel to provide expert testimony. Bevel informed the jury that he believed Peggy was murdered on Landings Drive and then either dragged or carried to the location where she was found the following morning. The testimony was critical in securing a conviction against him. If the jury had been presented with evidence that Peggy had been murdered somewhere else and then later dumped in the field, it would have been much harder to make the argument a 15-year-old boy who still rode the bus to school committed the crime. Tim was convicted of Peggy's murder and sent to prison. Bevel would later claim 
that he provided the testimony he did because he was not shown all of the necessary documentation and photographs to make a correct assessment of the crime scene. So then why the hell is he testifying if he doesn't have enough information? In 2005, Barry Goetz, who headed the crime lab at the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, contacted Bevel. He showed him reports and photographs that Bevel claimed he had never seen before. So maybe he did. We got to take his word for it. Bevel made the decision to write a report for Tim's defense, stating that he had serious concerns about the evidence or lack of it he received prior to giving testimony. Oh, wait, maybe this guy does have integrity. So, wow, okay. But he would later claim this. So Barry Goetz contacted Bevel and showed him this. After seeing it, Bevel made the decision to write a report for Tim's defense. So this might just be a clear incompetent, not necessarily somebody with malice, but just an incompetent who does try to do the right thing. But I mean, how many wrongful convictions is this guy uh, testified for? After reviewing the information Goetz provided to him, Bevel reversed his original claim that Peggy had been murdered and mutilated in the field. He said, quote, I do not believe all of that did take place at that juncture, end quote. CNN reported in 2008 that Bevel claimed, quote, he has never experienced a miscommunication of this level in more than 35 years of testifying as an expert and as an Oklahoma City police officer, but he was reluctant to say police deceived him, end quote. Wow. Wow, the blue wall. Man, so clearly he doesn't have that much integrity. But in all honesty, how could he even be sure he has never experienced another miscommunication of this level? That's a good point. Bevel's claim to not have received all the pertinent information relating to the case was a problem experienced by Tim's defense as well. This poses even bigger questions about other convictions Bevel has helped prosecutors achieve. How many other cases did Bevel, or any other bloodstain pattern analyst for that matter, work on where important evidence in the form of reports and photographs were suppressed by the prosecution or investigators? And what reports and photographs was Bevel missing? Was it not apparent to him that he had not received a complete record as it pertained to the case? Did he at any time have any concerns about the information provided to him? Those are questions I can't find answers to. I do know that the alleged science known as bloodstain pattern analysis seems to rely entirely on the honesty and accuracy of the police investigation. It also relies on the credibility and integrity of the prosecutors as well. If the police and prosecutors only provide limited information to the experts they ask to testify, is it really that surprising that people are wrongfully convicted? Another disturbing aspect of wrongful convictions is that they ensure those who perpetrated the crimes are free to commit future ones. I mean, this is why all these corrupt and or incompetent cops, I mean, they need to be held accountable and prosecutors. Because how, not only how many innocent people have they sent to prison, but how many guilty parties have they allowed to go on to commit more crimes against innocent people? I mean, that's all blood on their hands. The DNA evidence. In 2007, Tim's defense conducted testing of the clothing found on Peggy Hetrick. The testing revolved around an innovative and advanced approach to DNA testing, simply known as tough DNA. Selma and Richard Eichelboom, forensic scientists in the Netherlands, were approached by Tim's defense and asked to create a DNA profile based on skin cells left on Peggy's clothing. The couple was successful in obtaining a full DNA profile of a male. Skin cells removed from the cuffs of Peggy's blouse suggested she may have been carried or dragged by the wrists. The same DNA profile was found on the lining of Peggy's underwear, which had been pulled down to her knees. The DNA did not match Tim Masters, however. Instead, it matched, get ready for a shocker, Matt Zollner, the boyfriend Peggy had encountered at the Prime Minister the night she was murdered. I mean, is anybody shocked by that? Of course, DNA statistics, any time a female is met with foul play, it's usually the boyfriend or ex-boyfriend or someone known to her. Not some random 15-year-old high schooler. Not that it couldn't be him, but again, that's why you do honest investigation into all parties instead of zeroing in on some high school kid. His release. In 2008, Tim's sentence was finally overturned. A judge threw out the original conviction based on the evidence that was presented in support of his innocence. He was subsequently released from prison. Following his release from prison, Tim Masters brought a civil lawsuit against the city of Fort Collins. He reportedly received $10 million as a result of the settlement. He should have personally sued all these incompetent and corrupt police that tried to put him away as well, not just the city. These days, Tim spends... Because if, if officers knew that if they're corrupt scumbags, 
that they're going to be personally held liable, pensions suspended, et cetera, et cetera. They might think twice about committing all this corruption. These days, Tim spends time doing things he enjoys, such as working on cars. He wrote and published a book called Drawn to Injustice, The Wrongful Conviction of Timothy Masters, with co-author Steve Leto. The book details his case and the barriers Tim faced in finally obtaining a new trial. He has also spoken out about his conviction. In 2011, Tim joined a panel of speakers at the Colorado University Law School to discuss being incarcerated, his wrongful conviction, and the challenges people face when it becomes necessary to prove innocence. I decided to write about Tim's case for three reasons. First, his conviction was achieved through the presentation of a highly circumstantial case. The police made a rush to judgment and refused to consider other possibilities. These same behaviors have contributed to other wrongful convictions and have also played a role in suspected wrongful convictions. Second, Tim was convicted, convicted based on expert testimony provided by Tom Bevel. Bevel's name comes up in relation to a number of confirmed and suspected wrongful convictions. This same expert was responsible for helping police and prosecutors obtain a conviction in Darley's case as well. Not only has the science Bevel relied on come under fire in recent years, but cases like Tim's raise questions about the communication process that occurs between these experts and prosecutors. Finally, Tim's case is an example of how dangerous circumstantial evidence is in a murder case. Had police and prosecutors followed the physical evidence in this situation, even if it meant waiting for years until the technology became available to analyze it properly, they could have saved the city a lot of time and money. They might have apprehended the real killer. Most importantly, they might have given those who cared about Peggy a true sense of justice. But obviously, unfortunately, many uh, police departments are more interested in closing cases instead of getting the right guy. There's an interesting comment on this article by Razum. I would like to add that Tim was recently finally officially exonerated. This is quite unusual, and he had to wait three years after his release. I mean, this is just insane. I mean, some of these corrupt courts and corrupt systems, even when it's definitively proven it wasn't him, he still has to wait years for the official exoneration. I mean, that's insane. Also, as far as a misuse of science and circumstantial evidence, there is the Lucretia Murray case, an 11-year-old girl convicted twice of killing a toddler and sentenced to 25 years. The bogus expert testimony, as well as sloppy forensic science during the second trial, caused serious criticism, but in the end, it was true scientific endeavor that cleared her and prevented a third trial. Note that once the powers that be make a child the target of a politically motivated public outrage, usually nothing short of proving the child's innocence will stop the state prosecution, or shall we say persecution. Children in such situations become guilty until proven innocent, especially when local media initially participate in and profit from the demonization of the child as the Austin American statesman did in this case. The New York Times' Bob Herbert wrote eloquently on the case, among others, Lucretia spent three years in prison among mostly much older inmates, then several years under home arrest and similar restrictions before she was cleared. And, and hopefully she got a large settlement as well from these scumbags. I mean, if you have 100% definitive evidence, then yes. Then you go after the guilty parties, whether they're teenagers or, or whoever. But I mean, this level of insanity when there's no real evidence and they have to make it up or they don't like the writings of a high schooler. I mean, this is just insanity. So Tom Bevel, clearly a very dubious track record, yet a lot of goofs, just put so much blind faith in this guy's uh, testimony. It's really weird. And a silly string video. I mean, this is not justice, no matter how you look at it. If that's the best you got, it's a wrongful conviction, even if she's guilty. Beyond a reasonable doubt is a very, very clear standard. Okay, so I'm going to go over one more article here. Try to tie this all together. This is on Dolly Routier Unsolved.wordpress.com, June 24th, 2018. The Intruder, a serial offender. The case of Darley Routier is probably the most tragic example of how the state of Texas made the word justice something to be feared rather than something embraced. The young mother of three boys was convicted of killing two of them on June 6, 96 by stabbing them to death, probably one of the most terrible crimes a mother could be accused of committing. 
It may have seemed like an open and shut case. The forensic evidence was compelling. However, it wasn't long before inconsistencies, flawed evidence, and the manipulation of the truth by prosecutors came to light. It is not my intention to cover the disgraceful actions of the prosecution in manufacturing a false case against Darlie Routier. That has been covered in depth by other writers. The version of events by the defense was that an intruder was responsible for the violent and shocking attack on the Routier home, and there is more than sufficient evidence to support that. Of course, the main priority of Darley's supporters and defense team is to gain her freedom as soon as possible. So attention to theories of who could have been responsible for the attack takes second place to challenging the many flaws that led to her conviction, and rightly so. Even so, who attacked, who launched the attack on Routier's home is something of interest to me because I think there are important pointers in the evidence to the type of criminal who may have been responsible for the shocking crime. The first problem is that the Rowlett Police Department did not investigate whether someone other than Routier then Darlie Routier was responsible for the crime, even though there was evidence to support this. The crime happened at around 2 in the morning, 2.20 in the morning, and by 6 o'clock, based on the theory of one man, the perpetrator, as far as the police were concerned, was Darlie Routier. In any investigation, it is essential that all possible avenues are thoroughly investigated as a process of elimination to ensure, as far as possible, that the police are investigating the guilty party and not an innocent. This was not done, so any other evidence that could have been available to them or collected concerning an intruder was not discovered. Or was it and suppressed? Nonetheless, there is evidence that does indicate an intruder was responsible. The likelihood is that there would be no other immediately identifiable suspects because the routiers had no known enemies or anyone who would want to do them harm. I would propose that the attack on the routiers was conducted by a stranger, and there are key parts of the evidence that would indicate such a stranger would be a particular type of criminal. Of course, this is my theory based on my experience and knowledge. It may be right, it may not be. I will leave that for the reader to decide. But every time I have analyzed this case over the past six years, I keep coming back to the same place. The crime was committed by a serial offender, most probably a serial killer. There are no other motives that we know of, such as robbery, revenge, and so on. Serial offenders, such as serial killers, are fairly straightforward in the way they commit their crimes. Each has their own driving force, the reason they feel compelled to commit the crimes they do. Each has their own ritualistic behavior they feel compelled to go through in order to gain this level of satisfaction they desire from their actions. There are many common behavioral patterns that can be identified across different perpetrators of serial crime. Although taken individually, there is nothing to indicate any involvement of a serial offender. When we look at some of the key pieces of evidence in this case together, we can see a pattern emerging that indicates a serial offender is a high possibility as a suspect in this crime. Why Darley? This is something we can have no answer for unless we have the perpetrator. There could be hundreds of thousands, if not millions of reasons, why someone is attractive to a serial killer. The only other way we could have some idea is if we have information on similar offenses that seem to be related. Other than that, we cannot know stranger in the area. The first piece of evidence that we consider is that a stranger or strangers were seen by several witnesses in the area prior to the crime. Reports of a black car parked with occupants who appear to remain in the car for long periods of time without doing anything were reported. This car was seen at various locations where there was a clear view of the Routier home. Although there is some variation between accounts, the fact remains that there was a black car with tinted windows that was out of place and there was an occupant who stayed in the car. There is no known reason for this car to be in the area or to be parked in position in which witnesses observed it. It is a residential area with no commercial or municipal facilities that someone could be visiting or want to use. Vehicles or people in the area are going to be involved in a limited range of activities. Either they live in the area, are visiting one of the residences, or providing services to the area, or are conducting work on local infrastructure. The occupant or occupants of the black car sightings were doing none of these. Through witness statements, we know that the car arrived, stayed for a while, and then left with no other known activity related to the car or its occupants. This is a hallmark of someone conducting surveillance. On the night of the incident, a neighbor opposite the Routier home reported that they saw a small black car parked in front of their mailbox at around 2 a.m. When the neighbor was alerted by the commotion outside after the attack, the black car had gone. This was before they heard sirens of emergency vehicles getting close. The vast majority of serial killings are the result of planned courses of action by the perpetrator. Part of the ritualistic nature of the majority of serial killings is planning the crime so that the killer gains the maximum advantage over their victims to gain the maximum pleasure or benefit the offender desires. 
Targets are selected depending on the particular driving forces of the perpetrator, who will then observe the target to ascertain the best opportunity or circumstances under which the killer may be able to commit the crime. Serial killers like predictability. They want to follow the path of least resistance with the maximum chances of success of achieving their objective. They don't want unnecessary interference, and they want the lowest chance of being discovered or caught. In such an area such as Eagle Drive, there is nowhere secluded where an individual could park for an extended period of time and not be noticed. The times the car was observed tended to be at times when there wouldn't be much activity in the area, for example, early to mid-afternoon. It is highly likely that the car and driver were in the area at other times, perhaps in the late evening or early hours of the morning when no one saw them. The car and driver may have driven along Eagle Drive at other times and may have been seen by other residents who do not remember what would seem a normal event. Darren's Jaguar. During the normal day-to-day -day routine of the family, Darren usually parked his car in the driveway because the car would not fit in the garage. But two days before the incident at the Routier home, the car had been transported to a garage for repairs. I mean, is that coincidental too? I mean, two days before the killings? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. If someone were watching the Routier home, it would be easy to presume that the absence of the Jaguar also meant that Darren was not at home. That's a good point there. If it was absent for a second day, this could be perceived as Darren being away for an extended period rather than just the time the garage was under observation on previous occasions. To a person planning an attack on the home, this would mean that one problem or encumbrance to their objective was now absent and that it could be a favorable time to strike now that there was a lone female and three very young children in the property with no protection. As I mentioned earlier, serial killers are not interested in engaging in unnecessary confrontation. They will strike at a time that gives them the best chance of achieving their objective by following a path of least resistance. The time of the attack is significant. The attack occurred just after 2 in the morning. The quietest time in most residential areas around the world is between 2 and 4 a.m. That is the time when most people are asleep and there is the least activity on the streets. This is the time of night when human circadian rhythm induces the strongest sleep drive. This time frame provides the best opportunity for someone committing violent serial crime to be successful in their objective. There is less likelihood of people in the vicinity being aware of the criminal because they are likely to be in the deeper stages of sleep, and it is also the time when the intended victim is likely to be more docile and pose less resistance to the criminal. Again, the serial killer wants the path of least resistance. At this time of night, any potential human threat to this type of violent criminal is likely to be easier to subdue during the hours when humans are more alert. There have been many cases where a deadly attack has been placed against one person and other people in the same residence and sometimes in the same bed have been unaware until much later on at a time when their natural impulse to sleep becomes less. At 2 a.m., it is also reasonable to assume that the majority of people will be where they normally sleep at night, which is usually in their bedroom. In the case of the Routiers, it was normal for the boys to sleep in their room and Darley and Darren, together with baby Drake, to sleep in their bedroom. A person observing the property may have noticed a pattern of lights being turned on and off that indicated this was the normal routine. We know that Darley slept downstairs off and on because she was sensitive to baby Drake's movements that would disturb her sleep or keep her from settling. It could be that an offender may have noticed this pattern of behavior if there were external signs of lights being used room to room. Either way, an observer could gain a good understanding of the family's routine over a period of time. The kitchen knife. We know that the horrific violence that occurred in the Routier's home that night was inflicted using a knife from the knife block on the Routier's kitchen. This would indicate that the intruder did not go to the routier's home equipped with a substantial weapon such as a large knife or firearm ready for a bloody confrontation to inflict bodily injuries on a victim or to inflict immediately fatal injuries. This is not unusual in serial killings, in particular for the worst category of serial killer, the sexual sadist. They often have their own elaborate ritualistic methods for conducting their crimes, and these often include using methods of killing which would enable them to experience gratification for as long as possible. Some common methods among this group include using the victim's personal belongings, such as clothing, in particular underwear, used to strangle or suffocate the victim, or items from the victim's home which can be used in a similar way so that the criminal can experience the gradual draining of the victim's life. The use of the knife appears to have been a spontaneous response to the situation the perpetrator found inside the Routier's home, a situation they did not expect. The attacker was met with a scenario they had not planned for or expected. 
Damon, Devin, and Darley were in the lounge area and not in their respective bedrooms as the attacker expected at that time of night or morning. Damon and Devin were not the intended targets. They were barriers to the perpetrator achieving their objective. The perpetrator would have become frustrated and angry at having their plans disrupted and would seek to rectify the situation as quickly as possible so they could continue. Hence, the perpetrator using a convenient weapon, the kitchen knife, and using it with extreme force. The fact that Damon received significantly more but less penetrating injuries than his brother could indicate that he woke or partially woke when the perpetrator entered the area. The perpetrator would then have had to act swiftly to ensure the child would not do anything that would alert anyone else. Therefore, the stabbings occurred in quick succession with less power than those his brother suffered. Alternatively, because Damon was more separated from Devin and Darley, he could have received the immediate violent response from the intruder as they vented some of their anger or frustration. With Damon dealt with, most likely the perpetrator believing he was dead, the perpetrator could then take relatively more time to remove Devin as to the barrier to the perpetrator's objective. With Devin being closer to Darley, the perpetrator could take a second to build up enough emotional force to silently stab the boy to such an extent that the knife wounds nearly penetrated the boy's body and were likely to be immediately fatal. Raise the knife, pause to generate maximum downward force, strike, retract, and repeat. It would have been decisive and silent blows that the perpetrator could almost guarantee would be effective. The perpetrator's attention then would turn to his intended victim, Darley. It is unsurprising that Darley was not subjected to this same very directed stabbing as the two boys. Stabbing Darley was not the intention or part of the killer's ritual. In fact, slashing at Darley may have occurred as it became clear to the killer that their plan was disrupted beyond recovery, turning their attention to ensuring there were no witnesses remaining at the scene. Being in a highly frustrated or disappointed state, the perpetrator would have attempted to leave the scene as soon as possible and not waste valuable time or resources engaging in unproductive, as they would see it, violence. A serial killer would much rather escape the scene and choose another time and place with more chances of success than take unnecessary risks when the situation doesn't go to plan or serve the killer's ritualistic needs from the experience. Darley's panties went missing. Later on, Darley realized her panties were missing. She had them on when she lay on the sofa before she fell asleep. This fits with the ritualistic methods of the majority of serial killers. The taking of trophies that are items of a very personal nature to the victim. These trophies can be clothing, and particularly underwear, jewelry, or even parts of the victim's body, such as hair or skin. The perpetrator keeps these items as a reminder of the feelings they experienced as they were committing the crime, allowing them to relive the experience to some extent. It is common in sleeping rape cases for the underwear of the victim to be removed before they are awake, or during the early stages of waking when they are most disoriented. A killer who is skilled in their ritual would have little problem removing panties from a victim while they were asleep. Escaping a crime scene with a trophy is the prime conclusion for many serial killers and other violent serial offenders. The perpetrator took the sock. Darley Routier did not place the sock in the alley approximately 75 meters from the Routier home. Having aborted their crime, the only interest of the perpetrator was getting away as quietly and cleanly as possible. There was no reason to take the knife with them. It would have become yet another inconvenience in a disastrous attempt. On dropping the knife at the entrance to the utility area, the perpetrator picked up the sock, which was on their direct exit route as they left, and they used it to remove spots of blood either from their own skin or clothing. The amount of blood on the sock was very small compared to the amount of blood generated at the scene as the boys and Darley bled out and which covered Darley's t-shirt and hands. This indicates that the sock was not used to clear a lot of the blood and neither was it picked up by someone whose hands were covered in blood. The sock was disposed of approximately 75 meters from the routier home in the alley at the back of the house. This was the route taken by the perpetrator. The location of the sock is also significant with regards to the perpetrator's actions after the crime. Although we have no further information because the police did not investigate this possibility, it does tell us something when we look at a map of the area. It tells us that the perpetrator chose to head southeast from the Routier residence using the convenience of the alley at the rear of the property. They chose not to go west along Eagle Drive, which they could have done, and which would have been far easier if they wanted to get into a vehicle quickly, but would have been much more complicated to escape the residential area. Heading southeast along the alley would give them easy access to a vehicle either parked further along the alley or on Eagle Drive, and consequently an easier and much faster escape from the residential area, either by using Linda Vista Drive on to Dal Rock Road, or driving to the end of Eagle Drive and turning onto Willowbrook Drive and onto Dal Rock Road. 
Dalrock Road is a main road with easy access to a number of alternative routes out of the area. Being a main road, other traffic would have been using it throughout the night, enabling the perpetrator to blend in and escape unnoticed during the crucial minutes before the police would arrive at the crime scene. However, the most obvious route the perpetrator could have used to get to a vehicle does not account for the sighting of the little black car seen outside of the house of the neighbor directly opposite the routier home. On exiting the route to your home, the perpetrator headed in a southeasterly direction using the alley at the back of the house. A much more logical, shorter, and easier route would have been to exit the route to your home directly onto Eagle Drive and go the short distance to the little black car. Two things that could have made the perpetrator take the longer route along the alley. They were in a panic and wanted to get away as soon as possible, not really thinking of the direction they were going in. But this hardly seems indicative of someone capable of the cold-blooded planning used in this incident. The alternative, and most likely, is that they attempted to take the shorter route, but something or someone spooked them, and they went in the opposite direction to circle around to the little black car. A route that was darker and where it could be easier for the perpetrator to conceal themselves using neighboring gardens and other cover. It would be easy for the perpetrator to cut between the houses, many of which had no dividing fences or barriers. If they were spooked, this would explain why the sock was discarded where it was and not closer to the route to your home. The perpetrator would need cover away from the streetlight and the floodlights of the route to your home that were reportedly lit. Then they could return to their car with the minimum chance of being noticed. The location of the sock is likely to be the point at which the perpetrator made their way back onto or across Eagle Drive in between the properties. It is the point where light from the street lamps, etc. would be the weakest. The perpetrator could have crossed Eagle Drive at that point and make their way behind the properties on the opposite side of the road to emerge closer to the car. The total time it would take to cover the alternative route, which is in the region of 150 meters, would be no more than around 30 seconds for someone in a rush, running, or jogging at a normal pace for an adult. In the region of 11 miles an hour or around 5 meters per second, there are no witnesses that indicate anyone saw a little black car leaving the area. This is to be expected if people were aroused from sleep when the commotion started outside Eco Drive, the car would have left within 35 to 40 seconds maximum long before the commotion started. The police attending the incident made no report of passing or encountering a little black car on their way to the route to your home. This is hardly surprising because they were not looking for a vehicle at the time. They were concentrating on getting to the scene of a reported incident at a domestic dwelling. Murder in Texas. During 95 and going into early 96, the murder rate had dropped on previous years. However, there was a sharp increase of murders of people unknown to the perpetrator. In part, this was due to a trend where criminals would target strangers and their property for serious violent crime for no other reason than the violence itself. Texas is the second highest state after California for the number of known serial killings, which is probably related to its size. In the period 95 to 96, approximately 36% of murders remained unsolved in Texas, which is a significant number and could well include undetected serial murders. And also that's without factoring in the percentage of wrongful convictions that have yet to be uh, discovered. Because if murders are technically solved, but it's the wrong person, they still use that in the percentage. Rowlett Police Department. As I mentioned earlier, I'm not going to address the case against Darley as presented by the prosecution. Needless to say, the police department demonstrated incredible incompetence in the way they approached the investigation. And this is covered in depth by other resources and writers. Where it concerns this theory is that investigators effectively stopped investigating less than four hours after the crime occurred. Instead of investigating all leads and possibilities, they concentrated on one, that the crime was committed by Darley. This seriously inhibits us in finding useful information that could be vital in establishing if this crime was part of a string of other offenses by the same perpetrator or not. For example, obviously Darley was targeted for some reason, yet the police did not investigate if there were any events that could indicate Darley or any of the family were the subject of a stranger's attention leading up to the crime. Neither did the police investigate if anyone could have held a significant grudge against any of the routiers. If the police had taken the theory of an intruder committing the crime in a professional manner, they could have investigated vehicle movements throughout the analysis of public and private CCTV along the main routes. They could have conducted a campaign to try and establish the identity of an intruder by using the press and public appeals. The police could have investigated known offenders who match the description given by Darley and others through their databases and departments. It's not too late. 
Although many years have passed since the tragic events on Eagle Drive, there is always a chance that the perpetrator could still be caught or at least possible suspects revealed. The chances are that the offender has never been caught and may never have been implicated in any crime. Often, serial killers can operate for decades and never come under suspicion. When we think of serial killers, we envision that they go on some kind of rampage or are constantly indulging in their sick activities. But there are a high number of serial offenders who may go years or even decades between crimes. Finding potential suspects or crimes that could be linked to this case takes resources and dedication. It is highly unlikely that the police would even consider such an investigation when they think they already have the perpetrator behind bars. So we come to something of a dead end. Hypothetically, if an investigation were launched, there are several key things an investigator could look for. Similar crimes, a home invasion where a female was subjected to violence, probably including throttling or strangulation, or where the victim's own possessions, such as clothing that were used against them, crimes at a similar time of day where a female was subjected to an attack most likely in their own home of particular interest would be where personal items have been taken or gone missing victims that bear similarities to Darley, young woman perhaps blonde who stand out in their community crime where the perpetrator resembles Darley's description of the intruder and most likely involve extreme violence crimes where female victims have been abducted of course, this list is not exhaustive and the flexibility in the types of crime and victims would need be needed during the initial stages Serial killers can operate over vast distances, but I would commence any inquiries limiting the search to the state of Texas. Being one of the biggest states, it is likely that the perpetrator has committed crimes within its borders. Defining a time frame to search is tricky. We know that serial killers can operate over many years and commit only a few known offenses. Initially, I would limit a search to a year before and a year after this incident and see what materializes from that, expanding the time frame as necessary. The important thing is that the time frame is thoroughly investigated. Conclusion. I am not claiming that this is what happened. I am claiming that it is a real possibility considering the facts and evidence of the case as they are known. And this should have been investigated by police at the time. It is a theory or framework from which more in-depth investigation and analysis could take place. There are a series of indicators or flags that fall into place in the correct order, which indicate there is a high likelihood that this crime was committed by a very violent serial offender. The main flags are surveying or stalking the intended victim to analyze when the best opportunity to strike would be. In this case, the perception that Darley was alone with the children because Darren's car had already been absent from its usual parking place at the home. Not taking a substantial weapon to commit the crime, preferring to use another method. Although we really don't know, they could have entered with their own weapon, but opted to use the kitchen knife instead. The taking of a trophy, Darley's panties, showing no interest in stealing anything that was readily available, not the objective, and the perpetrator is likely not to have means to readily dispose of valuable items through a fence. Leaving the scene before completion, but not ensuring all victims were dead, there was an interruption or resistance that was difficult to overcome, leading to frustration that the objective could not be completed. This crime was neither committed by Darley Routier, nor was it a random attack. It was planned and executed as close to the plan as was possible. The important thing for a serial killer is the objective, often involving a ritual or series of events that need to be completed in order for the criminal to gain maximum satisfaction. If things don't go to plan, they become frustrated and would much rather get out of the situation as easily as possible than risk being exposed or caught unless that is their objective, which is rare. Serial killers are not brave and will avoid anything they see as detrimental or non-productive. Killing the two boys was nothing more than a nuisance to the offender. When it became clear that their plan had gone seriously wrong, the offender tried to implement some sort of form of damage control and then escape. You may agree, you may not. Based on my experience and knowledge and having looked at the case of Darley Routier in depth from different perspectives, I keep coming back to the same conclusion. This crime was committed by a serial offender of a particular nasty nature. By Martin Simmons, June 2018, on the DarleyRoutierUnsolved.wordpress.com website. So what does everybody make of that? I mean, it's an interesting theory. I mean, there's some coincidences that are not explained, including the guys attempting to burglarize or enter a house in the area and sightings of other suspicious vehicles in the area. But here's my final point here with the McGuire theory. Again, I do not claim it is true or untrue. I'm just throwing a theory out there. Is it possible that Darren did hire people to burglarize the house and that they were watching the house? They were in the black vehicle, but someone else entered the home and killed them. And so that these other criminals who never came forward, obviously, they just left. And it was possibly some other psychos that did this. Is that a possibility? 
I mean, I don't know. It's kind of weird. I mean, there's just so many weird people in the area and weird vehicles that have not been explained or investigated thoroughly. That's the takeaway here. So we really have no idea what happened. But there's an awful lot of weird activity in the area in the night in question. June 6th, 96, next to Highway 66, next to a cemetery. Make of that what you will. Leave your own thoughts, theories, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind in the comment section as we continue to explore this very, very perplexing case. If Darley is guilty, it seems that Darren would have to be involved. I mean, there has to be a high... It just seems very unlikely, based on all available information, that she could have pulled this off alone. But if Darren was somehow involved, that increases the possibility a lot. However... It's kind of weird to dismiss the fact that he's telling people to burglarize his home as part of an insurance scam. The the countless sightings of a vehicle or multiple vehicles and strange people in the area before, during, and after the crime. I mean, that's kind of hard to write off. It's kind of coincidental for this particular area, unless it, there's tons of reports like these, and it has not. And that's just a baseline. But I'm not sure it is for this area. So I hope everybody found another edition of the Mind Shock podcast interesting and informative. You can help support the podcast. Donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube. Like and share Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time.